Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and triangles of all ages. Welcome to another triangle strategy video. In this one, we're going to talk about characters. Now, just so I don't have a very long intro this time, I'm going to spare you all the little details and just say there are going to be spoilers in this video. It's going to be talking about every single one of the characters in this game, how you recruit them, what skills they have, what their stats look like, what weapon skills they have, all of that. Now, in order to minimize the spoilers as much as possible, I am going to leave the story spoiler recruitable characters until the very end of the video. I'm warning you right now, there are spoilers. And I will warn you again before the heavy spoilers come to play. I don't know if I can stress that or make it clear enough, but let's dive in. Our first recruitable character is the Lord Serenoa. Serenoa is a force deployed main character in the entire story, so he's pretty important and it would do you very well to learn about what he does. So Serenoa is basically your cookie cutter DPS Lord. He has, I think, one of if not the highest strength in the entire game and most of his skills are very damage oriented. You have Delaying Strike, which does physical damage and delays an enemy's turn, which is very handy. You have Pursuit Stance, which does extra damage on follow-up attacks, regardless of where he's positioned against the enemy, which makes him very useful to pair up with units on follow-up attacks. You have Hawk Dive, which is a 1-2 range attack, but he also has an enhancement for it on his T Tier 2 weapon that lets it go up to 3 range, so it's a very high power, it's stronger than your normal attack. 2 TP Charge, strong attack, that's single target. So this is going to be your bread and butter damage. He's got counter stance, which lets you lets. He's got counter stance, which lets you counter attack against enemies, so that's fairly straightforward. Sleeping, sweeping slash is an AOE attack that damages everyone around him within one range. So it's basically like a square around Serenoa. Strength in numbers increases his strength when allies are nearby, so power of friendship, pretty much. And shielding stance is actually a skill I thought was really useless on Serenoa because he's not really tanky, but you take 50% of damage for your selected ally for two turns, and if, it, if they're within three squares, I never use this on Serenoa ever. One of the tanks in this game does have this skill, and we'll talk about him a little bit later, but on Serenoa, I thought this was complete waste. I don't know why they gave it to him, it just doesn't make sense. And I don't have his weapon skill unlocked here, but I will go and talk to you about it in a second. So here is Serenoa's weapon tree, and if we go down to the bottom, we can see that his weapon skill is called Under Conviction's Banner, and it grants 1 TP to allies within a certain AoE range. And that's pretty much it. It's very simple. It's a TP buff. I don't think this is very good, because there are better TP batteries, and Serenoa having that high strength is better off doing damage instead. But I guess it could be useful, but if we're going for cost effectiveness, I would rather level up this, the weapon damage up too, because it increases weapon potency by 10, and it lets him do a lot of damage. He also has Route and Recover, which is recover HP when you defeat an enemy, which is useful for Serenoa, because a lot of times he's doing that high damage and he's going to be killing things. Also, if we look at his split here, it's either increasing the damage dealt by Delaying Strike. This is useful, but I didn't really find myself using Delaying Strike much unless it was on bosses, and that was to let other characters get in more damage. Most of the time I was using Hawk Dive, and increasing the range of Hawk Dive by one is huge. It lets him become like a long distance attacker, which is very useful. And that's pretty much it for Serenoa. He's fairly straightforward. You basically just want to do damage, 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 and maybe a little bit of HP and defenses, but damage and range. And that's pretty much it, so I guess we can move on to the next one. So next up is Benedict, and Benedict is amazing. Easily one of the best characters in this game. He is basically a support character. His damage is really, really low. You do not ever want to be attacking with Benedict, ever. That's just like the wrong thing to do. Unless you don't have any other choice and he can't buff anyone. But Benedict is basically your buff bot. He's got Raging Beast, which increases strength and magic for three turns. You've got Bulwark, which increases physical defense and magic defense for three turns. You've got Bird of Prey, which increases movement and jump by one for three turns. So all of these three are your basic stat buffs. Then you have his utility buffs, which now is a 3 TP range buff that you can use to immediately make your ally go right after Benedict, which is super useful. It basically just gives you another turn, so if you just moved and then Benedict uses now, you go right away again. Amazing. 
And then you have twofold turn, which lets allies go twice in a row. Now of note, twofold turn does not give the character that TP regeneration that they would normally get when their turn loops around. So just a heads up, if you're using it on mages, make sure that they have enough TP to use their magic attacks. It also doesn't work on any attack that has to charge for a turn, because technically the unit's turn doesn't loop here. It just goes twice in a row. So if you're using Frederica's charge attack that needs a turn to do the big AoE nuke, twofold turn doesn't work, but now does work. So just to make sure you guys know that, and that applies for Corentin's charge, for Archibald's charge, anyone who has to charge for a turn, this does not work on. And then he has Remain Calm, which is a passive skill that gives him immunity to Silence, Fury, and Temptation, which are not very common status effects in this game. I, I felt like I wasn't really hindered by status too much in the game, regardless of the mode, so there you go. And Initial TP Plus, he, gets, he starts out with 4 TP at the start of battle, uh, unlike other people who start out with 3. And his final skill is the weapon skill Dragon Shield. This is super useful. It's not as good as Eridor's one turn of invincibility where he takes no damage from anyone until his turn comes back around, but it gives you one instance of invincibility to all allies within eight squares. This is a life-saving skill, and this is why I say Benedict is so good. To me, a character is good if they can turn around the battle single-handedly by themselves from an unfavorable position to a favorable one, and all of Benedict's skills let him do that. The Dragon Shield lets you protect everyone, and the invincibility doesn't wear off, so it will be there for the rest of the battle, I think. And then twofold turn lets you go twice to kill an enemy or take care of a troublesome situation, or even run away. And now also gives you that flexibility to make sure a, a strong character can go twice, a healer can go twice, things like that. So Benedict is very much a character who can turn the tide of battle single-handedly. This isn't a tier list, by the way, but I will let you know when I think a character is an S-tier character, and Benedict is probably the first S-tier character we're talking about in this game. Amazing. He's also available in Chapter 1. I probably should have said that, but I wasn't very organized and this is unscripted, so there you go. Now, if we quickly hop over to Benedict's weapon upgrades, you can see that I don't really have many upgrades on Benedict, and I didn't do the weapon potency ones because, again, he's really not supposed to be doing damage. I have the HP ones because Benedict is tanky. I don't have the strength one. Again, why would I want damage? And then I have physical defense and magic defense. I have the effect of Raging Beast and Bulwark increased because why not have, you know, a higher strength and magic buff and a higher defense and resistance buff. And then I have his dragon shield. He doesn't really need the speed, but you can, you can buff it if you want him to go quicker. And he doesn't really need the extra Bird of Prey duration. I never really used Bird of Prey. I mostly found myself using now in twofold turn those are the really useful ones and i had a couple uses of dragon shield at some point that's pretty much it for benedict very straightforward to play just buff 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 he's an s tier character super easy to use very low investment great character all right after benedict we have frederica our fire queen and also the main wife of our main character Serenoa. A lot of people like Frederica, they, they give her the waifu factor seal of approval, and she is a very good character in this game too. I think she has the highest single magic attack in the game here at 62, so she has the potential to do the most magic damage in the game, and I'll follow up with why that's both a good thing and a bad thing in a second. But let's go through her skills, she's got fire resistance and ice weakness, which is interesting. She has an AoE fire attack called Scorch, which, which deals damage to enemies in a plus format, so you can hit up to five people with it, and it lights the ground on fire if it can be lit on fire. She's got Flame Shield, which increases an ally's fire resistance and grants the ability to counter fire attacks. Now, this is a little bit misleading in terms of the description of it, because Flame Shield lets you counter anything. It's not only fire attacks, so if you use it on your melee tank and he gets attacked by any unit, He'll counter any unit. I think the translation is mistranslated here and it's counter with a fire attack, so the enemy will take fire damage back. So this is really good on your tanks and it's low cost and it's very effective. But I also didn't really find myself using it because most of the time if I'm using Frederica, I want her for damage. She also gets Blazing Chains. So Blazing Chains is like Scorch in terms of the range and height it can hit at, but this is single target and does a lot of damage while also reducing their movement by one for three turns. So it's pretty good if you need to slow down an enemy, keep them far away from you, and also nuke them. Pretty simple, there's really not much more to say here. Fire Eater is honestly useless. 
It gives you the ability to absorb fire for three turns. I never use this. I don't know where I would find this useful, but I just never did. And then you have Pillar of Fire, which is interesting. So its range is one to four, but you're not very flexible on how you can place it. So if you can imagine a straight line coming out of Frederica from four different directions in four squares, so you can't do it diagonally from you. It has to be in a cardinal direction from Frederica. And whatever that square is that you pick, it's five squares horizontally across. So you can't like change the direction you want the pillar to come out at. It's always across. So it's kind of inconvenient and it's kind of high cost. I didn't really find myself using this very much. I think I used it once or twice, but it's really not a very viable skill in the end game because most of your enemies are all over the place. You will end up transitioning to mostly single target damage with Frederica. Magic Ablaze is also something that I didn't really use, which increases your magic attack one while on a square that's set ablaze. When it comes to being positioned properly, I find that inconvenient and inconsistent, so I just kind of avoided it. But if anyone else has used it to success, let me know. And then her weapon skill is actually very, very nice. It's an extremely high power, very wide AoE skill, but the downside to it is it takes a turn to cast. It does more damage the more TP you use, so when you use it, it will suck up every single point of TP that you have and channel that into damage. This is a fantastic skill for farming, and you should pair it with Now from Benedict. You can pair it with In Tandem, the quietest that lets you go straight after. Those are the two things I would recommend on using, because if you're going to wait a turn for Frederica to come back around, she's got 25 speed, so it's not on the highest speed level, and especially against bosses, they will tend to move twice. So if you're trying to nuke something, you want to nuke it before it moves, because that's what you, what you really set up for. So it's not super convenient. I didn't really use it much outside of farming, um, because in main maps, I just wanted to remove specific enemies very quickly, so I ended up using Blazing Chains for the most part. Now let's look at Frederica's weapon tree, and as you can see, I have completely maxed her out because I really enjoyed using Frederica. So she has the weapon potency increases. This is a no-brainer for her. You want her to do damage, damage, damage. The HP and the defense and, and magic defense can come secondary. They're really not that important. But this fire damage up with clear weather is really good. So if you're going, you know, to upgrade something on her, I would prioritize this last one and the first one for her damage increase. Most maps are clear skies. So you really will have this passive up most of the time. And then the next one that is really priority is getting the one TP when you defeat an enemy. This basically means that since Frederica's attack options are all two TP cost, if you kill something with Blazing Chains, for example, since it's her highest power or even Sunfall, you will recharge 1 TP, and then at the start of your next turn, you will have another 1 TP. So that lets you use the 2 to attack immediately again. And it means Frederica is pretty self-sustainable, and she doesn't need a TP battery. But early game, she'll suffer from some from uh, some downtime, and she will need some help with TP management. I obviously went for increasing damage by Blazing Chains, because single target damage was just so useful for me in the late game. I did not want to use AoE Scorch much but that's just personal preference. And Frederica was a unit that remained consistent. She was very strong in the early game, very strong in the mid game, still very relevant and viable in the late game for nuking things down, especially bosses. She's a great boss killer. I wouldn't put her too high, like in terms of, she's not Benedict tier of usefulness, but if I were to give her like a tier rating, probably A tier, maybe high B tier, depending on the rest. I don't know, I'm not really talking tier list here. I just wanna give my own opinion on the characters, so yeah. That's pretty much it for Frederica. Very, very, very solid character. Next up, we have Gila, who is our main sort of prototypical white mage slash healer. I think healers in this game are very underwhelming, and I'll tell you why in a second, but let's go over Gila's skills. She has Cure Wounds, which is basically your basic heal. It's a one TP cost move, and she can use it every single turn and spam it, which is good for a healer. You really do want that and her skill for those in need gives you an additional boost of healing if you're under 50% for the unit that you're healing, which is also nice. Haste increases your speed, I think it's by two points. I never found haste very useful because, you know, it slightly moves you ahead of your enemy. It's kind of like decreasing your enemy's speed at the same time. I never really used it much, but I never really used Gila much either because I didn't feel that her utility was strong enough to warrant a roster slot. Sanctuary is an AoE heal that is slightly lower power than Cure Wounds, so that's what it is. 
Heal what ails you is a status cure. This is useful because I think it is the only thing in the game that cures stop. Or maybe it doesn't even cure stop. But status ailments are also rare, like I said earlier, so I didn't find myself needing this very useful. And Mend Wounds is basically a, a stronger cure wounds. It's single target and it's 3 TP. And that's pretty much it. So moving on to Gila's weapon skill, because I didn't have that unlocked, I want to talk about it a little bit. It is called Miraculous Light, and it basically gives you the ability to revive after falling in battle. This is really, really good, but you don't really need this. So I played... I've done two playthroughs so far, once on normal and once on hard new game plus, and I have never really needed revives except for one instance that I won't talk about because it's major story spoilers. If you play your cards right, you will never need a healer because HP pellets are just so easy to use and anyone can use them. And honestly, there are some broken combos with pellets with some other characters that, you know, they would rather have that roster slot over Gila. So I don't think Gila is very good. She's okay in the early game. She falls off heavily in the mid game and the late game because of just other stronger units. But yeah, that's everything you need to know about Gila. If you're so adamant about using her, then I would level up her weapon damage potency here because that increases her healing. And then, you know, this or effective haste, like increasing it or increasing the duration is just a waste. I would have rather had her have uh, turning, for example, cure wounds into like a, a two square hit or a three square, you know, radius to hit or something like that. She does get increased ability range here for her healing, which is useful. But by the time you unlock this, you're just going to have so many better options. And again, like we said, the revive. So yeah, Gila, I'm not too impressed. I don't think she's a great unit, but she can be useful. I mean, healing is always useful for the most part, but I don't feel like you need her. Moving on, it is time to talk about Roland, the blonde, blue-eyed prince. And you can see that I don't have Roland max level because I absolutely hate Roland. He is a terrible unit to use, and maybe that's just me using him wrong, but I did not enjoy using Roland at all. For some reason, and I'm assuming that's because his lance hits two squares in front of him, he has a damage multiplier of 0.7x, which means he only does 70% of the damage that other units would do that have 1x multipliers. So he's already at a little bit of a disadvantage. His defense is really, really low. And his HP, his base HP is also really low, so that makes him very frail. Like, he's not surviving more than two hits of anything. And I have seen bosses straight up OHKO him on hard in one shot. He also has a weakness to spears, which is annoying. It's like he has a weakness, but he doesn't have a strength to anything. I guess he's good at cavalry just by the fact that all cavalry units are weak to spears, but there you go. Double thrust is a high power move that's single target. Rush is interesting because it gives him that mobility where he can move four squares and he does physical damage in a straight line along the way and then he ends up on the square that he gets to. So it really lets him maneuver. It's a little bit weaker than double thrust, but I mean that's at the exchange of movement and also hitting multiple enemies. Opportune attack is something that I actually liked. So if you move five squares or more and Roland can move up to seven squares at one instance, you will get an additional extra single target damage attack against the enemy that is next to you. And this counts as a separate instance and also gives you a separate instance of EXP. So if your Roland is underleveled and you're trying to catch up, this would be good to use. It really is just extra damage. It, it makes him useful. Pushback is really fun because you deal physical damage to an enemy and you knock him back three squares. If you want to knock things off bridges or cliffs or into walls or into other enemies or try to corner bosses, pushback is really cool. It's also single target though, so you have to use it up close. Flash of Steel is a 3 TP move that I think is very high cost for what it does. It's 1 to 5 range, it's in a straight line. A lot of Roland's attacks are in a straight line, so pushback, rush, double thrust, he's, his normal attack, it's all very much, you know, directly in front of him. But it's also fairly weak, So if you're, but it also has high range. So if you need that, you know, clutch high range snipe from Roland with his high movement, there you go. I didn't really find myself using this very much either. I was mostly using double thrust or pushback to position enemies, and I did not like using Roland at all. He's force deployed in a lot of maps and I found it annoying and I just wanted to bench the guy. Now let's look at Roland's weapon skills. Immediately I look at this and I'm like, you need to increase his strength. Because of his multiplier, he really needs that 
potency. What, what is nice is his tier 3 gives him 10 potency instead of the normal 5, so he ends up with a total of 20. And he also gets a really, really strong skill called Four Dragons on his tier 3 weapon skill. Now, I haven't used this myself, but I have heard from some very, very reliable people who have used it. This is a super high damage and potentially the highest damaging skill in the entire game. It ignores defense, like it says here, and it does physical damage to a single enemy. So Roland is very much a glass cannon. He dies very easily and he does a lot of damage with his four dragon skill and he's focused on mobility. I didn't enjoy using him. He's not my playstyle, but he might be to yours. And that's pretty much all I have to say about Roland. Next up is everyone's favorite early game carry, Anna, who is an assassin class, thief class, spy class, whatever you want to call it. She has one of the highest speed stats in the game in the roster, so she's pretty much always going first. She has an ability called Act Twice, which lets her do two actions in a single turn, but she only moves once. So if you're sitting, if you're standing still, you can attack and then move and then attack again or you can attack twice and then move, or you can move and attack twice, or use two items, or whatever. It's basically two turns to do whatever you want, but you only get one movement in between them. This is really, really good for set for setting up uh, follow-up attacks and also leveling up, and she does some great damage, lets her get behind enemies and maneuver and stuff like that. So this is amazing, and the fact that she gets it right out the bat makes her a very, very strong early game character. Throw Poison is a little bit of a short-ranged attack that can you know, throw a dagger and poison an enemy. Again, I didn't use poison much. I didn't find this very useful. If I wanted to use a skill on Anna, I would have used Slumber Stab to put someone to sleep on my second action to kind of take them out of commission and take the heat off myself during battle. But there you go. It's there if you need it. I guess it could be useful against bosses who aren't immune to poison since most of them kind of are. She has Take Cover, which lets her be literally invincible and undetectable by enemies as long as you're not standing directly in front of them. And what I mean by in front of them is in their line of sight. So if you're on the sides of the enemies or behind them, you can still be within the, that one square range, but as long as they don't see you and you won't be exposed and it lets you stay invisible for two turns. So you can sit there, stall, come out of it, attack someone, take cover again, sit there, stall, do it again. She lets you cheese a lot of the game. Sermon is nice, it basically just gives you a 15 height jump, and that can come in handy when maneuvering terrain. She does have a weapon skill that lowers the TP cost of this to zero and lets her do it for free, so there you go. Remain and Recover is basically HP restore when not doing anything on your turn. If you're taking cover and trying to stall for time or kite or something, that's good if, for Remain and Recover. Slumber Stab has a chance to put an enemy to sleep and it's pretty weak, it's the same. It's a little bit stronger than Throw Poison just because of the TP cost but it is a one range attack. It's useful. I've used it in a bunch of situations. It does help kind of lessen the enemy pressure on you if they're asleep. And surprise attack is kind of situational. It's basically your first attack out of taking cover is a guaranteed critical hit or something like that it increases damage. I don't know the exact calculation on it, but it is very nice, but it's only the first attack. So if you're using attack twice, surprise attack only works on the first instance of the attack twice skill. Her last skill is Deadly Blaze. I haven't experimented with this too much, but it is very high power and it decreases boss defense and magic defense while also doing damage to them. So this is useful against bosses, not so useful against enemies, but you can use it against things like shield bearers or anyone with really high defense or magic defense. Looking at Anna's weapon progression, uh, she has the whole potency unlock. You need these because Anna has, like Roland has a 0.7 times multiplier, Anna has a 0.5 times multiplier, which evens out because she attacks twice. So you definitely want the potency, especially for someone who attacks twice, that builds up. Then I was kind of torn on what to do with her because she really is just based on attacking twice. So the next thing I did was increasing damage dealt when attacking from an, en an enemy from behind. She already gets the guaranteed crit from that, but because of the way she plays, Attacking from behind is very useful, so I went with that. And that's pretty much it. Everything else is very optional. You want damage, 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 and you want to do it from behind, and you don't really want to get hit, so you can level up defense just in case, and HP just in case, but accuracy, she's never really missed for me. Surmount, I didn't really use it too much, but you can have it for free if you want, but I wouldn't prioritize it. And the speed, she already has great speed, so she is technically always going first. So here, the rest of the upgrades are pretty flexible. She is a very cheap unit to invest in, low cost, easy to use. I had her in S tier on my demo tier list because of how strong she is early game. I don't think she's very strong late game or on hard mode because in general, you do reduce damage on hard mode. But again, still a very strong unit, still a very useful unit, not very tanky, so she dies very quickly. Next up, we have Eridor. 
Eridor is one of my favorite units to use. He is a blast. Enemy pressure in this game is massive, and they hit you and they hit you very hard. The units that you'll see the most in this game are archers and melee units, and so physical defense is really one of the most important stats in this game, I would say. And Eridor has the highest physical defense in the game, so he is probably the best tank in the game. He only really has one other person to compete with, but yeah, Eridor's the man. And in all tank fashion, he has Provoke, which is a 1-2 to two range radius around you, and it can basically cause the Fury status, which makes enemies attack you. It has a fairly high chance to proc most of the time, usually hovering around 80%, so Eridor will be a very good Provoke tank. He has Sprint, which increases his movement by 1 for 3 turns. He's got 4 movement, so that's a little bit on the low side, but Sprint will give him 5 like most of the other guys to help him move around a little bit and get on the front lines. Shouldn't be too much of an issue. I never really had too much of an issue with Eridor movement. He eventually gets Steel back, which lowers damage when being hit from behind, so all those crits that you're worrying about from enemies hitting you from behind, Eridor doesn't have to worry about that. He's just set up to get tossed in the middle of nowhere and sit there and soak up the damage. Ram Foe is kind of like Push from Roland, except it moves them five squares and you move up one square. Again, lots of hilarious shenanigans with Eridor pushing people off cliffs. Physical Counter is very useful, it just works with his Provoke and Counter set. You provoke all the enemies and when they hit you, you get to counter back. You also get EXP when you counter, so there you go. Easy to level up Eridor. On the attack, I literally never used. This just raises your strength and lowers your physical defense. I don't know how strong this is. If someone wants to let me know in the comments, go ahead. But I never used this because Eridor just seemed like a tank roll. Why in the world would I lower his defense? And then this is a really fantastic skill here with Eridor, which is Desperate Defense increases the damage taken when his HP is at 50% or below. Now, I've heard that this decreases damage by half, which is massive. And there's another uh, artifact or accessory that also gives you this effect. So you can pretty much decrease damage by up to 75% if you use both combined. I think. I think that's how they work. I could be wrong. But this is very good. And then he has one of the best weapon skills in the entire game, which is basically he becomes invincible for a turn, and he's a guaranteed fury or provoke on all enemies within 1-2 to two range around Eridor. And this isn't like uh, Corentin's Ice Shield or the other invincibility, invincibility skill that we just talked about, where it's one instance, the one that Bene Benedict gives, the Dragon Shield. This is an entire turn, and Eridor is pretty slow. 24 speed is on the slower end, so bo most bosses will go twice before Eridor's turn is over. So if you use King's Shield, you are literally tanking the entire world until your turn comes back around. It is fantastic. In theory, if you have a really good TP battery, Eridor could be invincible for a pretty long time in the endgame, and that's actually how I was able to clear the final boss of the first map. I used Eridor, I just flung him in to stall for me with King's Shield and he was great. Now let's look at Eridor's weapon tree really quickly. He does actually get a little bit of mileage out of leveling up potency, but I wouldn't make this a priority because he does he is able to counterattack and he does have pretty decent strength, so he will hit for some damage, but I would rather go with defense, which I don't actually have fully upgraded, or HP. And maybe magic defense, although his is so low that it might not even be worth the three magic defense. Like what difference is it gonna make when endgame enemies are hitting you for 300 damage anyways? And then he has these really weird passives, which is increasing physical damage dealt or increasing damage dealt by follow-up attacks. These are very situational because Eridor is mostly tanking. You really don't want him attacking too much, and he's not going to be doing too much of it anyways. But I guess the follow-up one is nice, and the physical damage dealt is nice. Like I said, his strength isn't low, and it is worth raising his potency. Decreasing the TP cost of Provoke is very nice, but this comes really, really late for what it is. And then again, King's Shield is basically a must-have for the late game. It will carry you. Eridor was one of my units that sort of was good early game and then fell off mid game and then came back really strong in the late game when I did need that tank and I got those accessories to help him really soak the, the kills or soak the hits, I'm sorry, as well as I eventually locked King's Shield. So he's definitely a character that is deep investment. You want him at weapon rank three and you want him at class rank three. So this is probably the first character I'm going to say if you want to use him, he's high investment. He's designed to be a late game carry. He's very, very good at what he does, but you're going to be playing the long game with him. So either 
be patient with him or put him on the bench and bring him back later on. Next up is Huet, who is our flying archer. Now, in my early game tier list, I was a little bit hard on Hewitt because it didn't seem like she was very strong, I didn't really feel like I was using her properly, and I am completely ready to eat my words. At one point, I was thinking Hewitt was probably one of the best characters in the game. Easy S tier, her skills are super useful, she's always doing something on a turn, she's never doing nothing. And to me, that consistency is something I value very, very much. But as I played around with some other characters and some other combinations, I realized Huet might not be as broken or as useful as I thought. She's still a very useful character, like easily up there in A tier to S tier. Very, very easy to use, very, very low investment. She's weak to arrows because flyers are weak to arrows, that just makes sense. But her real use is from blinding arrow. It's two to four range and it deals physical damage to an enemy, and it has a fairly high chance to blind them, which means they're not going to be able to hit you. I think everything except mages can get blinded and make use of that. It's a 1 TP use, so you can spam this. Every turn, you can blind an enemy, and that, like I said earlier, I value a unit that can change the tides of battle single-handedly. Huet can do that. If half the enemy team is blinded, because blind goes on for three turns, you're not gonna really feel that heat of enemy damage coming at you. And so she mitigates that just by virtue of blinding arrow. Likewise, shadow stitching arrow immobilizes them and makes them unable to move. And it also deals a decent amount of damage compared to blinding arrow. So her ability to just kind of debuff enemies and status them into being useless is very, very good utility. She also gets increased range on her normal attacks. This isn't huge because like I said, you're probably using shadow stitching arrow or blinding arrow most of the time. Fell Swoop is a damage close range to the enemy. Hewet should never be close range, so this is kind of useless. Focus is nice because it increases accuracy and luck for free. It's kind of like uh, twofold turn or act again from Ana, where you can only move once, but you can do two uh, focus plus another action. I never really use this much because I don't. if I was using my TP, I was using it on Blinding Arrow. That's just how I wanted it. And Sight Set is interesting because this gives you sort of a status for one turn to attack anything that comes within your range. Think of it as like an automatic fire turret where Huet's range is two to four and any enemy that comes within two to four range or whatever the range increases if you're high up on elevation, you'll get normal, the enemy will get normal attacked. It's like distant, distant counter, immediate counter if you're within her, her radius. And her last weapon skill is Shooting Star. I actually like this. I've used this a few times. This came in handy with me because it's really high damage. A lot of the time, Huet is positioning herself to either nuke mages or nuke archers that are far away. So she, sometimes she does have that TP built up. And it does have an 8 square range, which is very nice. So, yeah, I've used this a few times. It's a good weapon skill to unlock. Is it necessary to have her 2-3? I don't know. Let's talk about it. So yeah, here is Huet's weapon tree. Like you can see, I haven't really invested too much in her. She tends to have pretty good accuracy, so you don't really need these accuracy buffs. Her weapon damage is definitely something you'll want to get because she is always attacking, be it with blinding arrow or shadow stitching arrow. So if you can have more chip damage, why not? The health and the defense are nice, but again, not necessary. Increasing your critical hit rate against enemies with 50% or less HP, very situational. I would rather prioritize weapon damage or blinding arrow duration plus one. Four turns of blind is better than three turns, so there you go. Or immobilizing with shadow stitching, you really can't go wrong with either of these. I went with blinding arrow because it is the cheaper option and I was using that more often. And then yeah, for weapon rank three, you can either get normal attack plus one, which again, not very useful because most of the time I'm using blinding arrow or you can get Shooting Star. I just went for Shooting Star because it was the brain dead decision to make. It's something I was gonna use more than normal attacks, so I went with that. So that's what I would recommend. So yeah, Huet, you get her very early. Her utility is undeniably amazing, especially in the early game. Very easy to use, very low investment, just a fantastic unit all round. She also gets honorable mention for being able to fly on top of roofs and cheese maps, if cheesing maps is your thing to do. I'm not gonna tell you how to do it in this video, but. If you want to do it, there you go. It's very easy to do it with Huet. It is time to talk about Corentin. So Corentin is your ice mage for the game, and he is very much a ice mage slash support unit. And he's very interesting. I actually really like Corentin. He can freeze the ground and turn it into ice. 
He can make walls of ice that literally block your enemy from progressing and crowd controls them. He can give your allies a shield of ice, which makes them invincible for one attack, but also lets them counter with ice attacks. Similar to how the flame shield that Frederica has works, except the shield of ice is only one instance of attack. So let's go over his skills. Blessing of Ice is like Frederica's Blessing of Fire, which increases ice resistance and lowers fire resistance. Icy Breath is like Scorch, which is your plus AoE that does ice damage. Frosty Fetters is like Frederica's Blazing Chain, except it does silence instead of lowering their movement. And then you have Wall of Ice, which does three horizontal squares of ice wall. This is very, very useful. So Corentin's support capabilities are way higher than Frederica's support capabilities just by virtue of Wall of Ice. You literally create three squares of ice that can just wall off an enemy, and you don't have to worry about them. They'll spend time hacking through it, and you can worry about other enemies in the meantime. It buys you time. It's two TP cost, so it is fairly expensive. One of Corentin's major drawbacks is he does not have a one TP cost option for anything. So without a TP battery, Corentin is going to be kind of struggling. He does get this TP on ice skill, but it's only on his third tier promotion. So it's going to take a while for Corentin to get off the ground. He also has Icy Tomb, which deals ice type magic to all enemies standing on icy squares within range and unfreezes the target squares. So how this works is the ground needs to be frozen before you're able to use this. And what it does basically is any enemy within one to four range of Corentin, or I think this is an AOE, will take damage if they're standing on an ice square. It's good, but it's very high TP cost. I don't see why I would use this over something like Frosty Fretters or Ice Breath. The damage isn't even higher than Frosty Fetters, so in the most cases it's situational. Shield of Ice is very interesting. I would use this on someone like Eridor or someone like Flanagan or anyone who's tanking or anyone I really need to save from an instance of damage. But again, three TP cost, very expensive. Most of the time you're probably gonna be trying to do damage with Corentin or use Wall of Ice. And then he has Glacial Moon, which is basically the alternative to Frederica, except Glacial Moon goes off immediately and you don't need to charge it and it doesn't cons do more damage when you consume more TP. It's just a 263 power massive AoE for four TP. Not as useful as Frederica's because it doesn't do as much damage, but it's more consistent in that it goes off immediately. I don't like it, I didn't use it. Again, I would rather use my shield or my fetters or my ice breath to attack more than once in a turn. But if you're in a pinch, and you need to hit a lot of enemies all at the same time, Glacial Moon can be useful. Let's look at Corentin's weapon skills. Again, he's pretty low investment. You basically wanna go damage, damage, damage for him. And then in rank two and three, you wanna go for the magic attack to increase his damage. This is the same as Frederica between Scorch and Blazing Chains. His is Icy Breath and Frosty Fetters. And you can see I have an inclination to lean towards single target damage in the late game, so that's what I did. The extra movement is very nice. I might actually prioritize this or get it third. It doesn't really matter because his tier two isn't very expensive. And then again, Glacial Move or Magic Up times two. I actually went for Glacial Moon here just because I wanted to see how it worked and how good it was. So there you go. That's pretty much it for Corentin. I don't think he's an exceptional unit. I think he's very good, but I would not put him on the same tier as Frederica because she's more easily able to kill things and output damage. Whereas Corentin, while he does have the nicer support buffs, he does kind of struggle to maintain his TP over time, less so than Frederica. But still a very solid choice. He's a good unit. I don't think there's any bad units in this game. I think every unit has their niche. And I think I can always give you a combo that is fantastic for a unit. So next up after Corentin is his alternative on the other side of the route split, and that is Rudolph. Now I also struggled with Rudolph in the last tier list because I never used him, and when I did use him this time around, I felt like he was actually more useful than I thought he would be. Straight Shot is a 2 TP move that absolutely blasts a unit, but it has to be used in a straight line, can't shoot through walls, can't th shoot through units, your own units. It has to be a clear shot but it does so, so, so much damage that it makes Rudolph a pretty good nuker. He also has Steel Trap, and these traps are fantastic. So it's two TP, and you can basically just put a trap, it's like a bear trap, and any enemy that walks on it will take damage and it'll end their turn. So he's very good at creating choke points and helping your tanks out take less damage. This is amazing. 
He has fight or flight, which, let, which lets him move an extra tile when enemies are within one to two range of him, which is nice. I mean, you don't want your archers straight up in the fray. Thrill of the Hunt increases speed for one turn when you defeat an enemy. Again, useful because he does so much damage with straight shot that it lets his turn next turn come around very quickly. Slumber Shot is sleep and some damage, so it's kind of like the alternative to he wets immobilize, he can kind of put people to bed. Those who wait increases accuracy and luck when you finish your current turn without moving. Because he's an archer, you might be placing him in a specific position and kind of parking him there for a while, letting him nuke things. So you will actually see use out of this. Although I don't know exactly what luck does, it increases crit, but it doesn't seem to do much more. And even accuracy is like, okay. Archers tend to have pretty high accuracy, but it's not like increasing the accuracy of his status or anything like that, so what's the point? Staggering Arrow, again, very, very fun. Knocking people off of cliffs is one of the most fun things you can do in this game. So anyone with like a push or a stagger or, you know, being able to fling people off walls, it's some of the most fun I've had ever playing a game. Let's look at Rudolph's weapon ranks. He's one of those characters where I was like, what am I going to do with you? He has nothing interesting in his tier one. He has nothing interesting in his tier two, except for damage. And even his tier three is like, okay, you deal physical damage to a lot of enemies within your radius. Great. I would rather set traps. So Rudolph is very low investment. All you really need is damage, damage, damage on him, and he helps you set traps and hit things from far away, but he's not a very interesting unit. He's very much the standard archer with a little bit of status and a little bit of helping out with crowd control. And that's pretty much it. He's not an amazing unit. He's not a bad unit by any means, but he's someone who will get sort of lost in translation between a lot of other much, much, much better units in this game. So after sort of these first, what, 10 characters, every other character you recruit is going to be based on your conviction levels or further route splits later on or certain story choices. So you no longer have any automatic recruitments. The order in which you get these characters will be kind of unpredictable. It's based on what your choices are. So I'm just going to go in a random order for these units. And the next one up is Julio. Julio is a unit I thought was not very interesting originally. He is a TP-based manipulating damage dealer of sorts. He's not exactly a buff bot like Benedict. He's not a DPS unit like Sarah Noah. He's not a total TP battery, but he can do all three of those. So let's talk about him. He has got a skill called Moment of Truth, which is two TP and then later on can be decreased to a one TP skill, which grants one TP to an ally and raises their strength and magic attack for three turns. So pairing this with mages is amazing, which are people who constantly need TP. Like Frederica, for example. So one of my very good early game combos was Julio and Frederica, because she didn't have the TP on kill, or if she wasn't consistent enough to kill things, Julio was there to buff her and give her TP. Fantastic. Not on my watch is the opposite. Instead of giving TP to your allies, it removes a TP from an enemy. I never found this to be very useful, except if I was using it on bosses to sort of keep them from doing their ultimate attacks or hitting them. Most of the time, I would rather use Moment of Truth. KOTP Plus is just like Frederica's. I think this is wasted here because if you're using Julio, most of the time you're using him to give other people TP and not to kill things. Finish them is interesting. It uses three of your TP to give an ally two TP. It's a good early game one if you absolutely need it in a pinch, but most of the time I would just rather buff them and give them one TP instead. TP Barrier is actually an interesting skill because it decreases damage taken the more TP have. And considering the way I used Julio, he usually had capped TP or near to it because he was using Moment of Truth, which was by then a one TP use skill. And he did have high enough TP to shield. Him. But again, he was paired with mages most of the time so he wasn't really on the front lines to utilize it, so it was okay. Best regards is magic damage to a single enemy. I actually use this quite a few times to help take down shield bearers. It does a lot more damage than you think against enemies with low resistance. It kind of gives him that spell sword feel. And then you have Inheritor. It has no TP cost. What it does is it basically gives all of your TP to your allies. So using this with Frederica's big sunfall skill, very fun. And then you have Intimidation, which is his weapon skill. So this one is kind of like Serenoa's skill, which hits all around him. But Julio's is a little bit lower power and hits all around him and lowers all enemy TP by one. Not terribly useful. If I was using Julio, I was having him do other things instead of attacking. Let's look at his weapon tree. He's one of those characters where you don't need to invest in him at all. 
at all at all. I gave him some weapon damage early on if I needed him to slap things early on. But again, I gave him physical defense because what does he need accuracy for? He's buffing or giving people DTP. What does he need luck for? We don't even know what that stat does. What does he need HP for? He's on the back lines. He's not getting hit. So, you know, physical defense and magic defense. The real thing you want is decreasing moment of truth by one. It makes it a one TP skill. It makes his ability to consistently buff and TP battery much, much easier. So this is the skill you want to prioritize. Everything else just depends on what you want. There really isn't anything specific. And even his intimidation skill is like, do I really want this? I'll take it to see how it plays. And, and that's pretty much it. So yeah, Julio is, I wouldn't say he's an S tier character, but he's up there. Like his ability to constantly provide you with support buffs and TP makes him extremely useful as a support character. And this game is all about the support characters. The next character I want to talk about is Hasabara. So Hasabara is the bartender who you find in your encampment. And again, she's another conviction based recruit. So if you have your convictions above a certain level, she'll just automatically come and join you. This is an interesting character because she is kind of like that paladin class where you can heal, but you can also do physical damage. And she kind of is a jack of all trades, master of none. So let's talk about Hasabara. She has Knight's Bane, which kind of like Roland is because she's mounted, she's weak to spears, pretty self-explanatory. Be Brave is her only healing skill, aside from something that we'll talk about later down the line. But what she does is she grants HP to allies that are all adjacent to you. So in front of you or the two sides of you or behind you will get healed. It's a two TP skill, so you can't always use it all the time. Cleave is a fun skill because it does damage in three horizontal squares in front of you, and you can also do follow-ups from behind the enemies, so it's pretty good damage. Tracking for TP is like the TP gain alternative of Roland's follow-up attack, so if you move five or more squares with her, again, her movement is really only five, I don't think you can boost it that much unless you give her the accessory, she'll get one extra TP, which is nice, but I wasn't using this very much because I mostly needed her positioned in places where she was healing. Pushback, we've seen this skill before. You can knock enemies off cliffs. Very, very fun, does a lot of damage. Desperate Defense, we saw this one on Eridor, so she takes less damage when her HP is 50% or below. And she's got pretty decent base HP, like 502 HP isn't bad. And then up and up deals more damage the more TP you have. So it feels like they were trying to make Hasabara someone who is more about attacking than she is about healing. And I'll talk about this a little in a little bit once we get to her weapon tree. But then she also has this skill called Catapult, and this really stumped me when I saw her at first, because it was like, you have all this attacking-based stuff, you have this defensive-based desperate defense skill, you have this TP kind of charging skill, you've got the heal, you've got the, you know, the, the cleave, and then all of a sudden you're telling me I can throw people five squares and raise their defense and magic? I was laughing when I was throwing Eridor around with Hasabara. Especially if you look at their character stories, these two have like an interesting back and forth. This is good for your tanks because it'll buff them and toss them into the fray, especially if they're low movement. And like, honestly, you can throw people. Like how badass is that? So I loved Hasabara. I used her in my first playthrough. She's not a great healer, but she does have the potential to be a good attacker. And let's get to the reason why Hasabara is a good attacker. So she has the weapon damage up all the way three tiers and she gets the extra 10 potency, which is great. She can also have one extra movement here. I forgot to mention that before. And she has the catapult skill, which I found very useful. Some people won't use it, but I loved it. Now, her ore here, in hindsight, I probably should have used HP recovery for two instead of increasing the effects of Be Brave, because on a follow-up attack, she heals herself. And that's one thing I really found lacking with Hasabara, is she was she's not very tanky and she was constantly low HP. And so I think this one especially since it'll heal her on, our on her turn and the turn of the other person. So if you're doing two follow-up attacks, it'll heal twice. And I never really tested this, but I hear it's really, really good. So in hindsight, I would rather take this one. Luckily, if you pick one or the other, you unlock both at the same time. Otherwise, she's super straightforward. Damage, 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 and then probably take HP recovery for two and maybe catapult if you want to throw people because that's very fun. Who doesn't want to throw people? Okay, time to look at Narv. So Narv is your classic jack of all trades, master of none mage. He has pretty much all the elements. You could say he is the avatar of magic. 
He starts off with Whirlwind, which is an AoE wind attack that hits from the front, and it's able to turn enemies around, or whatever the opposite direction they're facing in, to expose their backs. So this is nice, but I didn't really find myself using this very much with Narv. Sanctuary is an AoE heal. It's a little bit weaker than the other heals, but it gets the job done in a pinch if you need it. Icy Breath is another AoE uh, ice attack. Think the same as Corentin's. It freezes the ground in a plus shape. Spark is a single target damage lightning attack. It's the same as the one Izana have, and it has a chance to paralyze for two turns. Lightning magic is the best type of magic in this game because of the effect of paralyze. Now, Narv's is different than Izana's because Narv's paralyze chance is only 30% at max, but it can still come in very, very clutch, and the way it spreads on water is absolutely broken. So most of the time when I was using Narv, I was using Spark. Pierce Defenses is his passive skill that he gets, and it's actually really, really good. Any type of damage you do, you do to an enemy, it can be physical or it can be magical, lowers their magic defense for three turns. This means if he goes before other mages, he's lowering your enemy resistances. If he goes other after other mages, he's also lowering uh, their enemy resistances all the time. Other mages can do this too. I know Azana has this skill. So it's very synergistic with either or it makes you hit harder, which is the point of mages. They're all very, very good nukes. Scorch is the same Scorch that Frederica has, plus a shaped AoE fire attack. And he also has extending your reach, which increases the range of his command abilities by one. So basically this will be zero to five, this will be zero to five. All of his skills will be able to have one more range. The Whirlwind's range actually extends as well, which is interesting. And so does his healing. Mystic Beam is his weapon skill. I didn't really use this very much because if I was going to use Narv, I was mostly nuking with Spark. But if you have enemies sort of lined up in a straight line or a combination of enemies in your units lined up in a straight line that you want to do damage to and heal at the same time and you want to hybrid, Mystic Beam can be really good. Its range is 6, and I think that increases with extending your reach. I would have to test it, but I can't remember, but it does make sense. It is a command ability. And it's not elemental, meaning enemy resistances won't affect this. Now, looking at Narv's weapon tree, you can see I have him pretty much maxed. He is interesting because he has a lot of these ore things. So again, I found myself using lightning much more because it is better. So I'd use that to increase the damage on this. And between ice and fire, I did find myself freezing the ground to melt it later to turn it into water more. So I figured while I'm freezing it, I'll just increase ice damage. It is what it is. It also hinders enemy movement. And I didn't find fire to be a very useful element. Ironic for me, I know, but Ice and Thunder were, were definitely the way to go. Outside of that, Narv doesn't really have anything super unique on his weapon tree. Again, he has Mystic Beam here, which is really not that necessary. And the increased magic attack is nice on his tier three, so maybe prioritize this, prioritize Thunder, and then whatever one of the elements you use here. And of course, his weapon damage up for potency. For mages, that's huge. It increases damage and increases healing. You definitely want to get these first. So yeah, that's about it. Narv is fairly simple to use, he's really not that complex, and um, I think that's all I have to say about him. He really just works in any party combination and situation. He doesn't need anything special to make him work. TP batteries are good for him because all of his uses are 2 TP, so if you can do that and pair him with one of those, he is a very much plug and play unit in any team. He's slightly weaker than the other mages as a result of him being able to use all the elements, so that's just something to, to take into consideration. But yeah, that's pretty much it for Narv. Next up is Jens. Now, Jens has turned into one of my absolute favorite units in this game, just because of how good his utility is. Immediately, just jumping right into it, Jens has the ability to make traps and ladders, and he's kind of just like the, the toolbox unit that is maximum utility. The big thing I used Yen's for was spring traps. Spring traps are so much fun. If you put these on a cliff and an enemy stands on them, you will literally fling them off a mountain, fling them into walls, fling them into other units. You name it, the spring trap will do it. And you can put up to three of these. So if you need to like crowd control or make choke points or stuff like that, spring traps are the way to go. He gets a passive that lowers the Springtrap TP requirement to one, so you'll basically be able to put a Springtrap down every single turn if you want to with Jens. Jens is also fairly tanky. You can see here his HP is 536, and his physical defense is 59. He has one of the higher physical defenses in the game. So, you know, you can take a hit or two if you need to choke point with him. 
Ladder and Ladder 2 I will talk about at the same time. Now, the ladder skill is, you know, fairly simple. You basically place a ladder and you can use it to climb basically up the sides of cliffs, up the sides of houses. Anything that can be climbed, you can put a ladder on. This is really good if you want to cheese certain maps where you can get on the roof and, you know, put archers up there, get them to walk up there. You can use a ladder. Or if you just want to use it to gain a vantage point or chase down enemies further up, this is your thing to do. Ladder 2 is the sequel to Ladder 1. Now, you know how it goes. Sequels are usually not as good as the original, and by the time you get Ladder 2, you'll basically have been exposed to the novelty of, of Ladder 1. And, you know, I think the character development and the plot in Ladder 2 is a little bit weaker than Ladder 1, but it's, you know, you know, what's better than one ladder? Two ladders. So basically, that's that's what it lets you do. It lets you put two ladders simultaneously at the same time. It's very self-explanatory. Constricting Net is... You know what it says it is it is a delay turn of a single enemy it's a non-damaging skill it's one tp ensnaring the enemy increases the range of spring trap by two so i guess the, you can fling them even further slumber strike is a physical damage attack it's actually fairly strong i think it's stronger than his normal attack and it can put enemies to sleep for two turns and he does get a skill that can extend the duration of the sleep from slumber strike too it has a 60% proc chance on enemies as well, so that's, you know, fairly high and it's good for crowd control if you're not putting down spring traps or if you really need to put a specific unit to sleep. Hale and Hardy increases his max movement by one for one turn when he has max HP. And it's pretty good, it's not really necessary, I didn't really need it until the very end, and even at the very end you could probably say it was optional. Like, his job was mostly standing in the back lines and setting down spring traps and controlling things, or choking mountains with spring traps and flinging enemies off them. He's very good utility-wise. And Automatic Turret was something I didn't have unlocked until the very end. I'm a little bit lukewarm on this skill just because it's a 4 TP cost. And you basically, it's the same as Huet's um, skill that lets enemies get automatically attacked when they come in range, but the turret lasts forever until it gets destroyed. It basically has a certain amount of HP and enemies can attack it. And what it does is whenever an enemy comes within range of it, it fires off a ranged shot. This was dealing less than 100 damage on hard mode to enemies. So I would honestly rather be putting down spring traps and hitting enemies with slumber strike than putting down an automatic turret. I don't think this is a great weapon skill, but feel free to tell me I'm wrong in the comments. Now in terms of his weapon skills, Yen's is also a fairly straightforward unit to build. You basically want to increase his movement or his jump depending on what you want to use him for. I just went with movement because movement is generally king in strategy RPGs. And then you can decrease the cost of constricting net by one making it free or decrease the cost of spring trap. Let's be real, most of the time you're going to be using spring trap, so do that. And in terms of his tier 3, you can increase the effect duration of slumber strike by one turn to make it 3 or automatic turrets. I would prioritize slumber strike again just because I didn't really use the automatic turrets much. And then weapons, the damage up is honestly optional on Yen's. He can do pretty decent damage, but most of the time because you're putting down traps and ladders and stuff like that, it probably shouldn't be the main thing you prioritize. He doesn't really need any specific team comp. He doesn't really need any TP battery. Yen's is just kind of one of those units who you can plug and play on any team and he will work with very minimal investment. I want to say this guy can turn the tide of battle by himself, pretty much, or at least make your battle so much easier by himself with minimal investment. So Yen's is pretty up there in terms of discussion for what an S-tier character would look like. He's not a damage dealer, he's not a healer, but he is the penultimate support slash utility, utility unit. So that yeah, that's Yen's. Highly recommend you use him. He's very fun to play. That's That's pretty much it. So it's really hard to follow up Yen's, but I think Lionel is the unit to follow Yen's up with. Now, hear me out guys, but I think Lionel is one of the best characters in the game. And I'll tell you why, but you gotta wait it out. You gotta listen to me, because I know a lot of people will think Lionel sucks, and he does. Lionel sucks. Until you start to get lower down on his skill tree and unlocking his abilities. So let's go down them, and then I'll explain to you why he's so good. Lionel's charm ability is close range and it lowers physical defense and magic defense for three turns. I think this is garbage because, you know, having to be up in the enemy's face, even if he does have decent HP and decent physical defense, having him on the, on the front lines wasn't a very easy thing and tanking on hard is not very easy with someone like Lionel. Ruffle Feathers, on the other hand, is a chance to infuriate an enemy at range and you can do that and run away with Lionel and it's a two turn fury. So this is pretty good. I did find it useful to use on things like mages, on things like healers, archers, 
Stuff like that where I wanted to draw attention away from my squishier units, that was a good utility that Lionel had. Lucky Find just gives you money when you're picking up treasure, so if you're grinding out stuff and drops, picking that up with Lionel will give you more money. I think it's a thousand that he gets per thing that he picks up at max level, so there you go. Inciting Whispers is a chance to tempt a single enemy for two turns. You guys know how good tempt is, but Lionel's tempt chance is like 30% or 25% or whatever it is. This skill is really not worth using. I used it a lot in the early game, and it's just a waste of a turn, really. I would rather use Fury or actually slap things around with his whip. Brute Force is a super low accuracy, very high damage skill. Again, I didn't find myself using this much because if I was using Lionel, I was using one of his later on skills. Treasure and HP, I didn't really make use of this much because in the story, drops are pretty scarce, and so picking them up and recovering HP is kind of not the greatest. I don't know why they gave him this, but it's fitting with his personality. Unlocking Endless Speech is where Lionel starts to get really good. This is a ranged AoE in plus form chance to lower speed, or it definitely lowers speed, but it's also a chance to silence and put them to sleep for two turns. The chance on this is 50%, and I think the silence and sleep roll separately. So you can silence and not sleep, or sleep and not silence, or do both for two turns. This is super clutch. It does cost 3 TP, but like, what else are you doing with Lionel's TP? You're definitely not using Brute Force most of the time. You're probably not trying to use Inciting Whispers because that's pretty bad. Ruffle Feathers is okay, but it's 2 TP, and I'd rather wait a turn and use Endless Speech on multiple enemies than use Ruffle Feathers on one. Or you're using his weapon skill, Golden Opportunity. Which, let's talk about this. This is one of the best skills in the game. It is a ranged AoE in plus shape, chance to do pretty heavy physical damage, it does more than brute force, and it's also a 100% success chance tempt. It works 100% of the time. The downside of it is it costs 7,500 gold to use. I know, that sounds like a lot in the early game, but this is a late game skill, you're probably not getting this until the late game. And this is a game changer. This skill, you're, not, you're probably not gonna be using this every turn. But if you are playing on hard mode, and you are getting overwhelmed by enemies just left and right, and you have Lionel sitting there, and you can get him to 4 TP, fire this off. You can hit 3, 4, 5 enemies with this, tempt them all, and have them turn around and kill each other, and it'll buy you time for a turn. This is literally turning the tides of battle the character. He pays off enemies to hurt each other for a turn, and you get to chill and hang out for, for a turn heal, recover your TP, do whatever you need to do. Lionel will, quite literally, buy you time. So for me, when I got this skill, I was in late game in my New Game Plus hard run, and I was struggling up until then, I'm not gonna lie. I was having a rough time, I was using a completely separate unit of, of, of units, for lack of a better word. I, I picked nine new ones and I started out with them and I had limited resources and I didn't wanna grind. And by the time I was getting to the late game, I was repeating some maps like two or three times. Once I got Golden Opportunity, it was a wrap. I didn't have to repeat a map a single time after that. That is how good Tempt is. That is how good I think Lionel is. Now the caveat is, you need to actually get his tier three weapon skill. And even Endless Speech, I think, is, his tier, is one of his tier three promotion skills. So Lionel is a very deep investment character. Very, very deep. So much so that it's very hard to justify him as an S rank unit, but I think if you invest in him eventually, he could probably be argued for as like an A tier unit or a very high B tier unit. His early game is just really, really bad, and his mid game only starts to pick up once you unlock his tier threes. So yeah, in good faith, it's very hard to say, you know, definitely use Lionel, but he's a hack of a unit, like completely just annihilates all maps. So yeah, I don't want to gush about Lionel too much, but now you know my opinion on him. I think he's fantastic. I think he's so much fun, and his voice actor also did a really, really good job. I also just realized I didn't talk about Lionel's weapon upgrades, so we'll talk about those very quickly. I don't think any of these really matter, except for this one. Golden Opportunity, and like, great, you can increase Charm Effect, it barely hits. Or maybe this is important for Golden Opportunity. I'm actually not sure. I should turn this off and try testing it, but... Yeah, success rate of Fury, you don't really need that to increase. I think it'll go up to 100% if you do increase it. So there you go. But I would rather go with Charm, increase its effect, and pair it with Golden Opportunity. 
Everything else is not important. I have no idea what the hell luck does and why it doesn't affect status chance, but it is what it is. I gave him HP and I gave him a little bit of power so that he hits harder with golden opportunity and that's pretty much it. He's, he's very low investment when it comes to overall, but you do need to get him to his weapon three to unlock his full potential. All right, let's talk about Piccoletta. Piccoletta is a character that in my initial run was one of the first ones I recruited. I picked her up very, very early on because of my conviction levels and she immediately came in super clutch for me because of one very specific skill. She has item launcher, which is like whatever, it increases targetable range when using items on an enemy. That's not really that great, but decoy is the main skill that she has that's so good. She basically creates a clone of herself and can place it four squares away. So you can use this clone to choke point, to distract enemies. It basically gives you an extra unit on the field. You can't control this clone, unfortunately, but you can combo off of it. It can attack enemies. It can do basically everything that the normal Piccoletta does. I don't, I just think it can't use items and it can't throw balls from a distance. So this was really, really good early game, but towards the end game, she just kind of existed and took up space. I did use her throughout my entire first playthrough and she was easily my weakest unit, just creating decoys and then really not doing much for the rest of the map. Intensive items increases damage dealt by items used on enemies. So if you're throwing stuff, they're gonna do more damage. I think this is pretty insignificant. I didn't really wanna waste my items tossing them with Piccoletta. I would have rather have her making decoys or even throwing the ball toss wasn't very strong. It's just 133 power. So yeah, Piccoletta's abilities, she also doesn't have that many of them, which is really disappointing because you would expect a utility character like this to have more skills, but she just doesn't. And then Illusion Vanished is that the clone explodes when it's defeated and it deals damage to enemies around it in, in adjacent squares, which is nice for chip damage. But again, in a world where enemies have a lot of healers and the healers are very, very troublesome, this damage has been pretty negligible. It didn't really help me out too much. I'll quickly talk about Piccoletta's weapon skill because I don't have it unlocked, but it basically copies the last ability used by selected enemies. Enemies don't really have great abilities. The only ones I can I can think of are the stuff that bosses use. Like it would be hilarious to see Piccoletta copy of Laura's ultimate and use it on her. That would be really funny. But by the time you get this, it's really hard to justify bringing Piccoletta up to weapon rank three, investing all those materials in her, unlike Lionel. Copying that ability once and using it is fun, but you're only going to do this once per battle. Whereas for Lionel, you could probably use his tier three skill multiple times if you funnel him some TP. And that'll really change the battle. A boss ability won't really change the battle much, but hey, feel free to tell me I'm wrong. She, her or thing is movement or jump. I, I picked movement. And then all the rest of her skills are very, very generic. This increases ball toss damage, but it doesn't increase it enough to make it a viable damage skill. And then you have weapon potency. Maybe she wasn't doing much damage because I needed this, this next weapon potency upgrade, but I was not impressed with Piccoletta. Would not use again. C, she would probably be on the lowest of the tiers for me, like really far down there. High investment, good clone utility, but she's very squishy, low HP, decent evasion, low defenses. I just didn't have too much fun with her. Next up is talking about Miss Medina herself. Now, if it wasn't for a specific other character that I will eventually get to later on in the video, I would tell you that Medina is the most broken unit in the entire game. Legit. Medina has HP Physic, which increases the effect of health recovery items. So she is a item-based healer. Couple that with Long Toss that increases targetable range by three when using an item on allies, she can throw those HP pellets at a distance. She also gets double items, which is a three TPU skill that is very nice, that lets you use two items in a row. It's kind of like Act Twice from Anna, so you can use two items, but you can only move once, and you have to use them back to back, so you can't move in between. She has Poison Pellet, which is honestly not that great, you can poison an enemy for five turns, but like, why would I use poison pellet when I can use double items or I can use the next one, which is fast acting medication. Swift spices are things you can just buy from the shop. And this is pretty much the same as Benedict's now skill, but it has two TP and it uses an item or it's identical to the in tandem quietus. But again, two TP and it uses an item. You're honestly probably not really using the spices much in this game. So using them for fast acting medication is a pretty good deal. What makes Medina such a game changer is TP Physic. 
This grants one TP when using a health recovery item to the unit that gets healed. This probably doesn't sound massive at first, but we have something called ranged pellets, ranged healing pellets, and these ones heal in a plus AOE formation. Every single unit within that plus formation gets plus one TP when they're healed. So if you use that with double items, you can heal up to five units, and this works with the lowest cost ranged pellet. So it's only 750 gold per use, but you can heal two TP on five units on turn one before you do anything on the map if you give her the Vanguard Scarf. That's all you need to do. Give her the Vanguard Scarf, position your allies properly, open up with double items, and use the ranged pellet, and boom, your mages are, are capped. They've got their maximum TP. So this is what makes Medina so good. She can even use it on herself if she's within that plus, and that will loop her double items because she'll gain two TP, and then the next turn she'll gain one more TP, and she'll be ready to go to use double items again. So this is all about positioning. It's all about strategizing. I used it mostly with my mages, with someone like Lionel, with someone like Milo, who I'll get to later. This was very, very good. Medina is an easy S rank unit. She works on any team. Keep her out of the way. Just let her throw items and do her thing. Lady Luck gives you a chance to obtain bonus recovery pellets when picking up spoils. I mean, this is nice, but I, it's such a late unlock. It's locked behind her tier three promotion, which you don't need to do. By the way, she gets TP Physic on her second tier based on levels. So you don't even need to promote her to tier three. Medina's weapon skill is also Celestial Salve, which heals the entire map, and you use 10 HP recovery pellets to do it. I think these are the lowest cost ones, hence you can see how many I have held in 40. This is okay, but I would much rather be using double items and spamming her as a TP battery than using Celestial Salve, so I think this is just very optional, very situational, not necessary. If you do use this, everyone on the map gets one TP though, so there you go. In terms of her weapon skill tree, Medina also, also is a character who needs zero investment. At one point, the only unlock I had on her was her movement plus one. That's pretty much all you need. All of her skills she gets through leveling up, and nothing on her weapon tree is very enticing. She doesn't really do that much damage, and you'd probably rather be using her as a TP battery, so you don't need these. You don't need HP or defenses because she's probably not seeing combat. Speed is actually probably nice because then she can go more often. And yeah, her weapon skill, Celestial Salve, like I just said, is pretty optional. So yeah, there you go. That's Medina, easy S tier character, usable in any team, fantastic, and probably the best TP battery in the game. After Medina, we have another one of our mages, Izana, and Izana is a lightning mage who has a very interesting skill set, actually. She's pretty good. I enjoyed using her a lot. So she starts out with Rite of Lightning and Rite of Wind, as well as Rite of Rain and Rite of Tempest, right out the get go. And I think she also gets a Cursed Strike, or maybe she gets these a little bit later but she has a lot of skills and she's a Swiss army knife of magic. She specializes in paralysis, so her Rite of Lightning has a 60% chance to paralyze and it also does a lot of damage. It's a high power strike. It's single target, so you're gonna be doing a lot of that damage to a single enemy and potentially paralyzing them. The utility of this is insane. Rite of Wind is similar to Narv's wind skill, which hits enemies and turns them around. Not very good. I never use this on Izana. I was almost Exclusively, exclusively using Rite of Lightning. A Cursed Strike decreases enemy luck for three turns if you deal damage to them, who cares? Rite of Rain is really good, it creates a rainstorm. The problem is the puddles it creates are very random, so using Rite of Lightning will spread thunder damage through water and also give a chance to paralyze enemies who are hit by that spread. The problem is if your allies are also standing on water, you can spread the lightning to hit them and paralyze them too. So it is double-edged sword. I did try using this in the early game, but at the end of the day, I decided Rite of Rain is not worth using. I would much rather throw the Ice Stone and then the Fire Stone to create my own very calculated water blockades and use that to hit enemies with Thunder Magic instead. Rite of Tempest decreases bow accuracy of all enemies and allies for five turns. I generally have an ally that uses a bow all the time, so I never use this, so I don't know how good it is, but, you know, there you go. If, you, if you're not using bow units and enemy bow units are very annoying, this could be a very good skill to use. Pierce Defense is the same skill that Narv has, so it lowers magic defense for three turns. Very useful, if not the same turn, the turn after that Izana is there on. Rite of Luck is her tier three promotion skill. It is honestly garbage. Raises the luck of all allies for three turns for one TP. 
why in the world would I use this when I'm killing things with Rite of Lightning? It's just useless. I don't know why they would put such a useless skill for her tier 3 promotion. Her tier 3 promotion itself is worth getting just for the stat boost she gets. You can see her magic attack is 59. It's 3 less than Frederica, but she still hits really, really, really hard. Her tier 3 weapon skill I was very interested in initially when I first unlocked it, unlocked it because it deals damage to every single enemy on the map and you spend a turn casting it. It doesn't matter that you spend a turn casting it because it will just hit everyone regardless of where they are. And it also has a paralysis chance attached to it. The problem with this skill is it has really, really low accuracy and it costs five TP. So you're blowing your entire TP load on an attack that may or may not hit units. Like I've seen it go as high as I think 50%. That's probably the highest I've seen it go. And it goes down to like 30s and 40s and stuff like that. So I would rather just not use this and use Rite of Lightning instead and make sure I'm guaranteeing kills on enemies, at least in hard mode. In terms of Izana's weapon tree, this is all fairly self-explanatory. You definitely want the weapon damage up and you want these magic attack up ones. You want the decreased TP cost of Rite of Rain if you're using it and Rite of Tempests, you could get these, but Rite of Rain for sure. And you want the increased lightning damage dealt during a rainstorm. So, oh, I guess that's one reason to use Rite of Rain. Her damage goes up if it's raining. So you can create puddles and you can do more damage. I actually totally forgot about this in the late game. Her damage is so reliable without this that you don't even need it. So yeah, that's what I would prioritize. Definitely the weapon stuff, the magic attack stuff, and then maybe these two skills if you're going to use her to make it rain. And that's pretty much it for Izana. Fairly self-explanatory, doesn't need too much investment, easy unit to use. She's definitely up there in terms of tiers, probably closer to A or B. Again, I would have to really rack my brains to think about an actual serious tier list. But Izana's an easy use unit, very plug and play, very self-sustainable. Using her with a TP battery like Medina just makes her OP. So after Izana is one of my favorite units to use in the entire game, Archibald. Archie is a fantastic unit. He is very strong and he does a lot of damage and has very long range and he's an archer. So there you go. He starts out immediately out of the gate with a skill called Edged Arrow, which ignores defense. This is really, really strong. The range on it isn't very far, but he hits really, really hard with this. He also has the skill Sniper, which increases his damage the further away from the enemy he is, which is really a good way to play him because he's old and he's frail and he doesn't really have high defense or HP. So you don't really want him in the middle of the enemies. You kind of want him off on a hill somewhere, sort of sniping away from, from a distance. Arrow Spray is an interesting skill, but again, it has very low range and it's AoE and it's not very strong. So I would almost always be using Edged Arrow to try and actually kill something over Arrow Spray to try and AoE things that are pretty close up. Second Sight is a skill that increases his normal range attacks by one. It works pretty well with Sniper because it scales. Sticky Arrow is an interesting skill if you have extra TP, but outside of just trying to catch him up on levels, I never really use this because there was never really any reason to decrease enemy evasion for three turns. That's just how I saw it. I didn't really see enemies being too dodgy in this game, so it felt kind of like a wasted skill to use. Inescapable Arrow, on the other hand, is a very strong skill that Archibald gets that does not require him to be in his T3 class. So he gets it right out the gate in his T2. You don't really need to invest in him because most of these units come as veterans, which is already their tier two class. So you just need to level him up to get it. The range is really, really far on this. You can see it's one to 12. Couple that with his sniper skill, it's gonna do more damage the further away you are, encouraging it, you to use it. And if you put him high up, he's pretty much gonna be able to cover almost the entire map. In addition to this, it can hit through anything. It doesn't matter if the enemy is behind a wall, on the other side of the map, behind your characters, it is inescapable. He fires it up into the air and then it comes down and hits the enemy no matter where they are. I use this a lot to nuke enemy healers and enemy mages when they were running off in separate directions. Very, very useful skill. It has three TP cost, but again, put him near a TP battery or just let him do his thing. It'll recharge and you'll be able to use this pretty frequently. A Swift End, I think, is the skill you unlock on his tier three class promotion. It's decent, but it's not great. Most bosses are death immune, except for a handful, which I won't talk about because it's spoilers. But by the time enemies are below 50% health, even on hard, it's kind of like, they're gonna die within one to two shots anyway. So if this procs, it's nice. If it doesn't proc, it's whatever. So it's not a must have. He's very good enough in his tier two class. 
Archibald's weapon upgrades are also nothing crazy. I have them all just because I loved using him. I have them all except his last one because it's pretty expensive and I didn't really feel the need to get it. But yeah, what you want for him, him is damage, damage, damage. That's pretty much it. He starts out with three base movements, so the movement upgrade is pretty huge on him. And I also ended up giving him a movement bangle to give him that five move. It's very useful and I would recommend it. He doesn't need anything else outside of movement because he hits at such a long range anyways, so there you go. Increasing physical damage dealt during Tempest is kind of like high risk, high reward because Tempest lowers his accuracy. I guess you could get the accuracy bonuses here, but I never really use this. I just unlocked it because I like Archibald. And increasing damage dealt by critical hits is nice if an enemy has their back turned to you. This can actually increase his damage, so it's nice to have, but again, potency, 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 and move. And then maybe you can get crit damage or accuracy. And increasing the normal range of his attacks is also nice because he will be normal attacking quite a bit. His mastery skill for tier 3 weapon rank is Piercing Arrow, which is damage in a straight line of 10 squares that ignores defense and it also requires a charge for one turn. You know how I feel about charging skills. They are inconsistent if you're waiting because enemies will move, but this one is very, very strong, especially against bosses. So you'll need to use it with now in tandem, or Medina's uh, Swift Spice skill to get him to move immediately because if he's charging for a turn, odds are the enemies are going to move. And that's pretty much it with Archibald. He is basically the prototypical archer who does pretty much nothing but damage enemies. He's always offensive. He's always attacking. I was constantly using him to pick units off. He's very strong. You don't need to pair him with anything to make him work. He is just a pretty self-sustainable unit, and he will be very, very clutch for you if you invest in him and use him right. Not an S-tier unit, but definitely very high on the tier list just by virtue of the fact that he has a 2TP attack that ignores defense. It makes him a fantastic boss killer. So yeah, that's pretty much it about Archibald. After Archibald is another relatively old man in Flanagan, and Flanagan is the second of the two tanks that we get in this game. Now, coming off of using Eridor, Flanagan is kind of... Eh, you know, I much preferred Eridor's skill set to Flanagan's. I know Flanagan can fly, and he does have some interesting utility with Aerial Assault, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But outside of that, as a pure tank, Eridor is vastly superior in every single way. But let's talk about Flanagan's skills. So he has Hawk's Bane, which increases his damage to arrows, which is not something that you want to see with a flyer. I would have much rather seen a skill on Flanagan, maybe even like his tier 3 promotion or one of his tier 3 skills that nullifies damage done by arrows because that's what I think tanks need. They need to be strong and not weak to things. He has Ironclad which decreases damage taken head on which is basically the opposite of the um, back attack lowering steel back skill that um, Eridor has. So it's pretty good. Shield Bash is nice. It is a one range Fury attack with pretty high accuracy. I think this one goes up to around 80% Fury, so this is pretty good. It's a little bit of a bummer that it's only a one range thing when Eridor has an AoE Provoke that is one to two range. So that makes Eridor a slightly better tank than Flanagan. Aerial Assault is interesting because Flanagan has four movement and with Aerial Assault, he can also move another four spaces. So it gives him up to eight movement and he can also do it regardless of elevation or basically, you know, the plus 10 minus 10 elevation. So the mobility on Flanagan with Aerial Assault is actually quite good, quite nice because of this. And you're really not using his TP much for anything else, so using Aerial Assault will give you more damage. It's an AoE, so it does around wherever he lands, and it gives you mobility. Shielding Stance is interesting. I did find myself using this a little bit with Flanagan. Unlike Serenoa, Flanagan can actually take a couple hits, and so splitting the damage that an ally takes with Flanagan is, is quite useful. Fortify is also nice, but you get it pretty late in Flanagan's level up tree. This is one of his tier two level up tree skills, and it just raises your defense by a lot, but lowers your movement by one for three turns, which is that really necessary? He's already a four movement unit. He's not a very reliable tank, and you're lowering his movement even more, so he's gonna have trouble catching up and using things like shielding stance or shield batch if he's constantly using aerial assault to catch up. It's kind of weird and a little bit not synergistic for Flanagan. Safe Haven, however, is actually a really nice skill, but the auto recover HP at the start of your turn is very, very small. It's only something like 50 HP. And when enemies are hitting you for easily 150 and 200 damage, 50 HP in the grand scheme of things is not that much. 
You can pair it with the accessory that gives you another 50 HP recovery for like 100 HP per turn, but yeah, I don't really know. It's, it's not enough. Like if this was 100 HP, this would be way better. It, like pairing it with an accessory that gives you back 150 per turn, that's at least a single enemy attack or maybe two if he's buffed up, you know? Rampart is also nice because it decreases damage taken by adjacent allies for three turns. Again, I prefer Eridor's skill, which makes him an out and out tank versus what Flanagan seems to be trying to do, which is sort of decreasing the damage that your allies take instead of him tanking head on. He's a different style unit. I did not enjoy using him too much, but I did commit to him in an entire playthrough and he had his moments. He's not bad, but he's not a, a great unit either. He's very solid mid tier maybe even on the lower end like he does not hit hard he does not contribute much to a team he just exists like there's no scenario where i would use him over erador for example or him over a different damage dealer or a utility unit so that's where i stand on flanagan let's look at his weapons weapon tree looking at flanagan's weapon tree again very straightforward i actually tried to give him the potency upgrades in the event that maybe he'll do some damage wasn't really great the defense ones are probably a no-brainer. Getting him that extra 6 defense will get him up to 70 base defense, which is still lower than Eridor. Eridor has the highest defense in the game, but Flanagan is pretty up there. His Rampart, again, not worth it here. HP upgrade and magic defense upgrades are pretty good. Speed isn't really going to help him much. And decreasing the TP cost of Aerial Assault by 1 is actually really good. So you do want this if you're going to use him to try and constantly be mobile and catch up to where your allies are. Immunity to being knocked back is nice. But I never really found him being knocked back too much. So, you know, this one is a judgment call. I would prioritize potency, defense, and aerial assault TP over this. So yeah, that's pretty much it for Flanagan. Let's move on to the next character. Also, one thing to note that I forgot to mention with Flanagan is that the previous units that I had talked about between Archibald and Julio are all some of the lower and easier conviction characters to recruit. Once you get to Flanagan and the next couple, these require higher level convictions to recruit and are a little bit harder, so you'll be getting them a little bit later on in the game. So for example, I didn't get Flanagan until very late in my progress. I actually didn't get him until New Game Plus because my morality wasn't high enough, for example. And the one after Flanagan is going to be Old Lady Groma herself. So I really, really wanted to love this unit. You know, I saw their kit. It's a super synergistic skill set right out the gate. The problem is, Groma is designed to be an evade tank, and evasion in this game is really, really inconsistent and unreliable. Unlike Fire Emblem, where dodge tanking is very viable, I don't find dodge tanking in this game viable at all. But let's talk about her skills, and then I'll tell you why. Groma has evade detection, which is nice. It basically lets her move through enemies and obstacles unimpeded, and be able to get behind enemies and hit them pretty hard. She's got Sweeping Kick, which hits across three horizontal squares with a chance to immobilize them for two turns. At maximum, this is a 50% immobilized chance, so it's not the most consistent skill to use, but I did find a lot of use out of it. Eliminate and Evade is a must trigger for someone like Groma to work. It increases her evasion for three turns when you defeat an enemy. Without this, her evasion is very middling. She does need to kill something to get going or have some kind of evasion buff on her. Energy Wave is basically a Hadoken that, you know, Groma fires off at range. It's pretty good damage, and it's pretty low cost, so you can use it. Lure in is a chance to infuriate all enemies within range for two turns. It's basically just around her, and it's nice if you want to use her as a dodge tank, which honestly doesn't really work. Cross counter counters when you evade an adjacent enemy's physical attack. Again, because of the way evasion works, it just... It, she's not evading very often. She dies. She's very flip frail. She's got low HP. She's got low defense. So it's, it's super difficult for her to evade, despite her getting, you know... Eliminate and Evade, which increases evasion. Desperate Evasion, which increases your evasion when HP is at 50% or below. But this is her tier 3 promotion skill, so you really have to invest very deep into Groma to even get her to be remotely viable. When she works, it's beautiful, but more often than not, I found that she was failing me. And right now you can see her evasion is 76, but I actually had two extra evasion accessories on her, which boosted evasion by, I think, 8. So she got up to 84. And even with 84 evasion, it really wasn't enough to lower enemy hit rates by that much. Looking at Groma's weapon tree, she wants to do damage, so I would invest in damage, but I would also invest in her evasion here. I don't know why they didn't give her another tier of evasion. She really, really needs it, and she needs something like another 5 or 10 evasion. Like, 1 or 3 is not that much in the grand scheme of things. 
And her ore skill here should also increase her evasion even more when she uses a skill like Infuriate or something like that for an enemy. Instead, it's decreasing damage dealt or increasing damage dealt by her counter, which is evasion, or increasing damage dealt by follow ups. This is useless. It's completely useless on her. It's really, really bad. Increasing her match HP, max HP and defense are completely counterproductive to her skill set, which is based on dodging. Why would I want defense or HP if I'm supposed to dodge? It, she is all over the place. She's a terribly designed unit, and the game formula does not help her at all. Increasing speed is nice, but again, speed doesn't contribute to evasion. It only contributes to how quickly you move, so this doesn't help her. As well as this Skyward Fist skill, which hits regardless of enemy elevation, I rarely found enemies to be that high up on an elevation where I would need to use this. So I didn't even unlock it. I was like, this is an evasion tank. This skill is not evasion based at all. And I could not make Chroma work. I would not invest in her again. She needs very deep investment, a lot of support. She's supposed to be meant to be some someone that can go off, kill something, and then be off on her own for a while. And she just dies. She needs a constant healer. She needs a constant babysitter. She doesn't have the stat line to back it up. And evasion is just terrible in this game. Groma is probably one of the lowest tier characters just because of how bad she is. And it really pains me to say that because at first glance, her kit looks so attractive and it just falls off so hard. I am so sorry, but you know, that's just how it is. So we're coming on up to sort of the last few recruitable characters in this game. Now the next three characters are not spoilers still, but they are the high conviction based characters. So for anyone who doesn't know, there are three characters that you unlock if your conviction levels are over 1600. If you're not grinding heavily in your playthrough, odds are you will not see these characters until New Game Plus. And it shows in how good these are. I know there's other story-based characters that unlock before these that you will see on your first playthrough, but because of spoiler reasons, I'm leaving those until the very, very end. So let's go over the conviction-based ones first, and then we'll get to those. The first conviction-based unit you can unlock is Decimal. Decimal is attached to the Morality Conviction. If you have above 1,600 Morality, you will automatically get Decimal in a story point after Chapter 5, I think on New Game Plus or any other playthrough after Chapter 5. Decimal is a mathematician. This is basically the calculator class for anyone who's played Final Fantasy Tactics, but it's a lot less broken. He has Automaton's Artifice, which makes him immune to all status ailments, but he does not recover TP naturally at the start of his turn, and this is really important for a nifty combo that I'll talk about in a little bit. He has Charge TP, which is basically when he moves or doesn't use a skill, he gains 3 TP, which if you look at his skills, they're all either 2 or 3 TP cost, so this is a must. He's going to have downtime no matter what you do unless you have a TP battery on him at all times, because he will just not regenerate his own TP. And then next come his skills. So he's got target for HP 3, HP 4, and HP 5. And basically what this does is if you have an enemy within 110 range on all of these skills, he will do non-elemental magic damage to all enemies within 10 range whose HP is either a multiple of 3, a multiple 4, or a multiple of 5. I don't know why the 5 one needs more TP and does more damage, because multiples of 5 are a little bit rarer than multiples of 3 or 4, at least in my opinion, unless it's maybe the very start of the game. I don't know. I haven't really looked at the breakdown of what HP is, but, you know, it is what it is. And then he has Assist for TP 0, which raises the magic and strength of all allies within range with 0 TP for 3 turns. I found this extremely rare. I don't think I had allies with 0 TP much on the map at all, just because of how strong TP-related skills are. You generally always have your TP buffer or booster doing something at one point. So this is a little bit anti-synergistic. But what is synergistic with Decimal and what I will show you here that I don't have not been showing off really is accessories. So if you scroll all the way down and you look for an accessory called the Obsidian Anklet, you'll be able to see that this increases strength and magic attack but prevents natural TP recovery at the start of your turn. It increases strength and magic by a whopping 5. And because Decimal already has Automaton's Artifice, he's already not gaining TP naturally anyways, so you get all the upsides of this accessory without any of the downside. So this is hands down the best accessory for Decimal. Outside of that, we can look at his weapon ranks. He gets potency increase, and I, I kind of question why he doesn't get another one, because when I was using him, I found him to actually be fairly weak. He didn't really do that much damage for me, but maybe that was just me. And you can see I did increase the damage dealt by all of these three skills. So yeah, I don't know. I just could not find a way to make Decimal very reliable. All of his other stat stuff is 
pretty meh. You can see his HP is really low and his defenses aren't very high. He's very much a character that is supposed to be away from the middle of combat and he dies very quickly if he's not. He also only has one tier three weapon rank skill, which is kind of disappointing. And this one is just target seven. So it does the same thing, but enemies with seven HP and it does more damage the more TP you're, you're consuming. So this could be a very powerful nuke. It doesn't charge, which is nice. But again, just the fact that enemies have to have HP that ends with seven makes it so inconsistent. So yeah, I don't know. Decimal to me is actually another bottom tier character. I would not invest in him much. Not like he really needs that much investment, but he's just someone that I don't see being very, very good in the long run. Also, just a quick note for Decimal, mine wasn't promoted, so I'm going to show you promotion stats here. So his promotion stats go up by quite a bit. He gets an extra 7 or 8 in almost every single stat that he has, 10 for accuracy, and he gets the skill target 5, pretty much, height 5. So any enemy above you, who are 5 or more squares above you, get hit by this. Again, this is another very situational one. It doesn't improve my thoughts on Decimal, but I totally forgot that he has more HP and more stats that he can get, so for the sake of being thorough, I just had to show this. So after Decimal is Giovanna. Now, this is one of the characters that I didn't really use very much. I used her a little bit, so my estimation might be a little bit off, but Giovanna is an interesting character. They actually tried with her, and a lot of her skills are based off of her trying to be this elemental switchblade of sorts. So she can do a little bit of everything, but not much of anything unless the terrain is right for her. So let's talk about it. She gets Brock Toss, which deals physical damage to a single enemy, and you can boost this through her weapon skills, so it can be pretty okay. But again, see, she needs conditions. It has to be Flatland, Rock, or Pavement to be able to even use this skill. She gets Trekking for TP, which we've seen before. She has very high movement for some reason. She's got six movement. It can go up to seven through her weapon skills too, which is crazy. But yeah, you get an extra TP if you're moving five or more squares. That's pretty self-explanatory. IV Beam is a pretty strong magic attack that's 2 TP cost that deals non-elemental magic to enemies in a 6 range line, so kind of like Magic Beam from Narv, and it also gives you a chance to immobilize them for 2 turns, so it's actually fairly decent, but again, conditions are it has to be Grassy or Wheat Field, which is not very frequent in this game. Splash is similar, it's basically an, a heal to an ally from 0 to 6 range, but you also have to be standing on water in some sort. So shallows, aqueduct, pond, salt, wall, salt, salt water, or puddle, otherwise she can't heal. You have to be on some kind of water. TP to power increases your strength and magic attack the greater your TP is, and you get more of a boost. This, honestly to me, makes her a better physical attacker than anything else, even though her almost entire skill set is magic based. Scorched Earth, again, a fire attack with 1 to 6 range and deals damage to enemies in a straight line, so the same as Ivy Beam, but you have to be standing on Molten Iron or something that's on fire. And it's also 3 TP cost, which is pretty heavy, so the setup for Giovanna is extremely inconvenient that it makes her such an inconsistent character. Again, I didn't use her much, but from little use I had of her, I was pretty frustrated that I just couldn't access her skills unless I had to fulfill a bunch of different situations beforehand. She does get another ability called Gelid Barrage, which is an ice attack, and she gets that on promotion. So let me show you that. So there you go. You can also see Giovanna's promotion stats. Her magic attack is on the relatively low side, and so is her strength, unfortunately. So, you know, that's a bit of a downside for her. But let's talk about Gelid Barrage. It deals ice-type magic damage to enemies in a straight line and freezes the ground. So there you go. It's basically Scorched Earth, but the ice type version and you need to be on deep snow or on a frozen tile to even use this in the first place again so it's just very inconsistent it's pretty strong it's got the same strength as scorched earth but is it really worth using the metal of valor on a unit like this i don't really think so but let's talk about her weapons weapon skills and trees so you can see i spent almost no resources on giovanna just because i i didn't believe in her at all she does have the potency increased by up to 20, so her physical damage could probably be pretty good. Gaia's Roar is non-elemental damage, magic damage to all enemies in a cross shape with you at its center. Again, this is positional based, and I'm not entirely sure what the terrain requirement is. If it has no terrain requirement, this is probably pretty good, so you can physical damage with her and then magic damage with this. But because she's a hybrid, I'm not quite sold on her because her bases are pretty low. HP, defense, and evasion are just like whatever on her. She's pretty frail in general anyways, but the movement increase would be very good. Seven movement on an infantry unit is, is really, really good, and it also increases her ability to use TP trekking quite well. Increasing damage dealt by Rock Toss would probably be the way to go over increasing range, just because she lacks quite a bit in damage, so you would want to increase that. That's how I would prioritize her. I think you want weapon damage up 
movement up and then rock toss up and i really haven't used gaia's roar much so i can't really talk about it but yeah that's it for giovanna i think she's very average if even below average for a character and honestly that's very very disappointing for a new game plus unit that unlocks you would expect these ones to be very strong she's not very strong and decimal isn't very strong either but the next one we're going to talk about is broken so let's move on to the next one okay so this unit is so broken he probably warrants a tier list of his own or at least a tier of his own because he actually physically destroys the game he can infinite loop time to trivialize almost every boss and stop every unit on the field and there's nothing that you can do about it i actually don't think they really thought this unit through and maybe i'll make a separate video on how to actually cheese entire maps with kohog but he's just he's he's way too strong Time compression raises the speed of an ally within range for three turns. You're probably not going to be using this with Kohog. What you will be using is turn back time. So this reverts a unit's position, HP, and status changes to their states from the caster's previous turn. So basically, let's say I have Serenoa, and I move my Serenoa, and I overextend with him, and I use Hawk Dive, and I deal a lot of damage to an enemy, but Serenoa takes so much damage that he's very low on HP and he's kind of in a situation where it's it's rough and I wish he was not there. Well, I can use turn back time and the range on this is zero to six so it goes very far. And what it does is it immediately undoes or undoes everything I did with Serenoa. So it reverses his HP back to full, for example, from being very low and any statuses he could have. So if he's immobilized, if he's paralyzed, if he's charmed, if he's stopped, all that stuff gets removed, but any damage I did on the enemy still remains. So if I killed something, that character's not coming back. It's literally only Serenoa. So this is an amazing skill. This is really, really good. In due course is basically his damage skill. So it does non-elemental magic damage to the enemy on their next turn after they move. And it also hits adjacent enemies. So this is pretty powerful, especially for a one TP skill, but it's not what I would be using with Kohog if I'm using him. I'm mostly using turn back time or I'm using the next skill, which is warped space. This is basically a warp staff. You move an ally from within six squares of you to any location within five squares of you. So you just warp him. The downside of this is if you're charging a skill like Frederica's or something that requires you to charge or cast, you're going to have to stop this when you're warping. And that makes sense because you really don't want to waste that charge when you're in a completely different location. So there you go. Stop time is what makes Kohog so broken. And I think you can see the use of this, right? He stops everyone but himself for two turns, preventing them from taking any actions. And then you get the use of one more command, but you can only move once. So in theory, Kohog can stop everyone and then turn back time another unit. So that unit is no longer stopped. Now you do want a TP battery with him, but you will eventually be able to loop stop time and turn back time quite a few times, or at least enough times that will let that one unit that you have turned back cheese a boss or something like that, especially since it's two turns worth. So this is very good. I don't know if they thought this through, but there you go. Distort space is switching positions of you and a selected unit. That's pretty straightforward. I would also generally never use this. Like why would I, generally if I'm thinking about switching spaces, it's because I wanna move someone to a space where they're no longer in trouble. But why would I move a very, frail mage into a spot with a lot of trouble unless he's going to move afterwards and get out of that trouble something like that so i would again i would just rather warp them it's the same range so why not just warp them or turn back time to bring them back this one just kind of feels like not very useful and remain and recover we saw on anna i don't think this is very useful on him i don't know why they gave it to him but he's broken enough already that i can't really complain about this his major weapon skill is reverse space time now if you've played Fire Emblem Echoes or Fire Emblem Three Houses, this is basically the turn wheel or divine pulse. It reverts everything on all allies and all enemies to the state they were from the caster's previous turn. So if you completely screwed up a turn and you want that back to redo it, you hit the panic button in reverse space time and he rewinds it and you can tackle that turn all over again as if nothing happened. So this is really, really good as a panic skill, but again, I would be using stop time or turn back time much more often that I probably won't get to for TP to use this skill. But this unit is broken. He's easily the highest of high S tier, if not double S tier. Like he would deserve his own tier. He's disgusting. But if that wasn't enough, let's talk about his weapon skills. 
Quahog's weapon skills, to make up for his brokenness, are actually not that great, so his potency is okay if you're gonna attack with him, but I never really attack. However, his ore increases the duration of time compression by one turn, which is speed, or increases the effect of time compression. Again, this is something I'm not gonna use, but what you should upgrade probably is his speed. He can get up to six extra speed to make him move quicker or move more often. His reverse space time weapon skill is also one of his T3s, which is pretty much a must get. It's really good. Increasing jump by one is here for some reason. I don't know why. And increasing move by one. So I'll take the increased movement. That's pretty handy. But the must have from his tier three weapon rank is probably reverse space time if you do want that panic button. If you don't, Honestly, you really don't need to invest in any of Kohog's skills for him to be broken. He is broken just by virtue of leveling up and getting his... Cl and even he doesn't even need class 3, because his class 3 skill is remain and recover, so he's good just out the gate with no investment. Just leveling him up, he'll be busted. So yeah, I don't know why they made this unit so good. I think part of it is because he's locked behind the 1600 utility conviction, because Giovanna's the liberty one. So... There you go. If you want Kohog's 1600 utility conviction, odds are you're going to get him on New Game Plus, but he is just disgusting. He breaks the game wide open. Okay, so now I want to issue a major word of warning. These next six characters that I'm going to talk about are route specific. So I'm going to be talking about split routes and how you get them. And there are so also are going to be super major story spoilers. The first four don't have super major story spoilers, but they do have route specific or certain split specific spoilers. And the last two I'm going to talk about are absolutely massive story spoilers. So I'm warning you now, and I'll warn you again before we get to the last two, that you're entering spoiler territory here. So if you don't want to hear about this, now's the time to click off. Cool? I'm going to get started. Alrighty then, so first up when it comes to the story spoiler units, these are all the chapter 15 recruits. So in chapter 15 there are four different units that you can get, and you can only get one of them per playthrough. So you will have to do four separate playthroughs in order to cover every single one of the chapter 15 recruits. I'm going to start with Travis, because Travis is the more unlikely of the four for you to get. In order to recruit Travis, you need to give up the Roselle in chapter 11 or 12. I forget which one is the decision. I think it's 11, but you need to give up the Roselle and send him back to Hyzant. And then in chapter 15, you have to go and investigate the Roselle village. If you don't give up the Roselle and you fight for them, and then you go investigate the village in 15, you end up getting Trish. So that part of chapter 15 is split between Travis and Trish. You can't get both on one playthrough. You got to do two separate ones. As annoying as it is, I don't know why they did that, but there you go. Travis is also a very weird unit. I did not promote him because I played around with him a lot and he just felt like a unit that I wanted to drop and not use very seriously. He looks cool, he's got an interesting personality, but I don't know, he just never clicked for me. He's got pretty high strength. As you can see, I'm on the promotion screen right now so that you can actually see what his promotion stats are. And across the board, it's not bad. He's got pretty good HP, Pretty good strength defense, and he's got a little bit of magic defense, so he's not like an armored unit. And overall, his stats aren't bad. In terms of skills, he's got backward toss. I mean, we all have seen this one because it's literally the first boss in the game. So he it does decent damage, and he tosses an enemy behind him. You have Mug, which is lower damage but steals an item. This I found to be really, really underwhelming because most of the items you steal are like the spice things that you use. And maybe you can get some like some of the lower tier pellets, so it really isn't that good. On your guard is nice because it decreases damage taken when you don't have any allies nearby, and you can also pair that with steel back, which decreases damage from behind. So he can take a few hits, he's reasonably tanky. Impending strike is damage across three horizontal squares and delays a turn, so you can delay multiple enemies at once, which is decent. He's got fortuitous follow-up, which gives you a chance to steal an item during a follow-up attack. Again, like Mug, it's kind of underwhelming because the items aren't really good, and his promotion skill is what really has me shaking my head. Trial by fire, really? It increases your strength when you're on a square that's on fire? That's such an underwhelming promotion skill. A lot of units get some really, really good ones. This one I'm just looking at, I'm like, the only reason I would promote Travis is for his stat boost increase, which is pretty significant. Like. If you look before stat promotion, that's 8 strength he gets, 8 defense, 6 magic defense, 5 luck, 8 accuracy, and 7 evasion. He gets pretty significant boosts from promoting, and that's the only reason I would promote him, but I found him really uninteresting to use for some reason. But let's go ahead and look at his weapon stuff. 
All right, so here we go. Here's Travis's weapon skill tree. Again, he can do some pretty good damage. So you generally want to do potency, potency, potency. That's just how it is for anyone who does damage. I really don't know why he has fire resistance 50% on his tier three. Fire magic isn't really even that prevalent in the late game. A lot of it is either like thunder or ice or you're going up against arrows. I, know, I don't really remember seeing much fire magic. Maybe it was just the routes I went down. The rest of his stuff is kind of like stats, which is like luck is always a wasted stat, in my opinion. HP is nice, and like one to physical defense and magic isn't really going to change him much. You have increasing mug damage or decreasing the TB cost of backward toss. Uh, I was trying out the mug damage to see if it's actually worth spamming, but I think the TP of backward uh, toss decrease is probably more worth it in the long run. Other than that, his heavy smash is actually really, really powerful because it charges for a turn, and then you deal physical damage to all enemies. Let me show you the details of it one second. Okay, so here is his heavy smash skill. So the range is one to two and it's 315 power. So it's a little bit higher than backward toss, but it is an AOE. So it's, it's nice, but again, I'm not a big fan of charge skills and wasting an in tandem or a now on someone like Travis when I can use it on a mage or someone who can use it much, much better than him feels like a waste. So I don't know. I'm not very convinced about his skill set. I don't like him very much as a unit. Definitely one of the lower tier units. It doesn't feel like he has much synergy with anyone else. It's very nice to throw someone behind you and then use that for combo potential, but I don't know. I I would need to see some some convincing evidence of why people think Travis is good. So let me know in the comments if you do. Outside of him being able to take a few hits, I'm not convinced he can do very much of anything that's very, very strong. Okay, so now it is time to move on to another one of the chapter 15 units, and that is Milo. You can acquire Milo if you go back and you visit your father back home in Wolfort, and she automatically joins you permanently on chapter 15. You do get her in 13 and 14 as a temporary member, but unless you go down to that specific route, and the game does a good job of telling you like, hey, Milo seems interested in going with you back to Wolfort Castle, so maybe you should go with her. If you go with her, you get her. And honestly, like, just like I said, Kohog deserves a tier of his own. Milo isn't quite broken tier, but she is extremely good to the point of she is a no-brainer for S tier. And I'll, and I'll tell you why. Her first few abilities are kind of lackluster, like Green Mist, Poison's an enemy, Boohoo, I don't really care, does magic damage. Her magic attack is higher than her strength, so I guess that's not bad. Blue Knight is nice because it debuffs the enemy and steal their, steals their TP. This is great for bosses. Amazing for bosses. Debuffing them and stealing TP so they can't use their high TP skills is fantastic. Instinct is nice because it makes her evade -y. Even though evasion isn't really that good, she has 75 base evasion, which isn't bad. And increasing it with instinct without really needing much more of a requirement means she can sort of jump in and do things on her own without having to worry about dying too much. And the reason she can do that is because she has this skill called Moon Jump, where literally for one TP, you can jump to anywhere within five spaces as long as you're not really impeded by another unit or by a certain elevation. You can jump in, use something like Blue Knight, and then because Moon Jump gives you an, another actual turn to move, if you haven't already used your move, you can then move your five spaces that Milo has. Or you can do it the other way around. You can move spice five spaces and then jump five spaces. So she is really, really flexible in terms of her movement and her utility. To add insult to injury, or you know, for our benefit, she has Heart Stealer, which is a very good temp skill that lasts two turns. Lionel's lasted one turn, Milo's lasts two turns, and it's also 80% accurate. I think earlier on it's probably 50 or 60%, but she has a weapon skill that increases the chance of tempt, and I'll show you in a second. Evade detection is also something we saw on Gromo, which lets her run through enemies or run through obstacles, which is really good for someone like Milo. Stardust is an interesting skill, chance to paralyze all enemies within range for two turns. Paralyze is a great status effect, but what is better than paralysis is charm. And honestly, for a three TP skill, if you add one TP and you use her weapon skill, which is probably one of the most broken weapon skills in the game, you get power of love. This is absolutely worth getting, and Milo's weapon tree, I'm telling you right now, is completely worth maxing. She is a absolutely, extremely, unbelievably, undeniably, indisputably amazing unit. Because here you have an AoE, tempt skill, 
also with a 100% chance that you can use at range. It's kind of like Lionel's skill, except you don't have to pay money and it doesn't do damage. You just tempt everyone for one turn at an AoE and she is single-handedly able to completely flip battles on their head with this. And again, 100% accuracy on something like this is crazy. So Milo is very, very good. She's also very fast with 28 base speed, so she will be going first before a lot of enemies. Now to look at her weapon tree. I mean, you can, this is self-explanatory. I maxed it as quickly as I could. I even got the damage because, you know, why not? The evasion increase is nice. The speed increase is nice. And here was a little bit of a head turner because it's like green mist or blue knight yeah i'll use blue knight to increase the debuff i guess for one turn but i'm really not in the end game you're not really using these you're mostly spamming these and here's the heart stealer success rate up so that boosts it up to an 80 percent and here is the power of love which is the guaranteed 100 percent tempt that milo has so yeah basically you really only need these bottom two and getting the evasion and the speed is nice. So I would recommend the evasion, the speed, and the two weapon rank three skills. You do want to promote her to tier three and you want to get weapon rank three. She's a very, very good unit. Absolutely worth investing into as soon as you get her. The only drawback is you get her so late, which is chapter 15. That's like well past the mid game. You're in the end game at, this, at that point. But in things like new game plus or new game plus hard mode or new game plus plus, she will be super good and super clutch. So she definitely warrants S tier, even if her availability is suspect and it's low, just because of how much of a hack she is. And that's pretty much all I got to say about Milo. Use her, invest in her, love her. She's also kind of hot, so, you know, there's no negatives there. Next up on the list is Cordelia. Now, Cordelia is a little bit of an interesting unit. She is not the best, but she's also not the worst. And because she's chapter 15, she is also quite a late recruit for you to get. And you get her if you decide to stay in the capital and pursue diplomacy. Now, what's interesting about Cordelia is she has the highest magic attack in the game at 66. It's higher than Frederica's at 62, but she can't attack. She is an absolutely pure healer at heart and she does zero damage at all whatsoever. I mean, I guess you could bonk someone with her rod, but you know, why would you do that when you can use her to heal? Anyways, let's look at her skills. She gets regen, which is exactly what it says. You give small amounts of HP regen per turn to an ally for three turns. She has heal, which is a two TP basic single target heal. She has rest and recover TP. So if she doesn't move, she gets an extra TP when she ends her turn. You can still pursue an action with her, like you can heal and then just not move and she'll gain that TP. So this is nice. She gets healing region, which is an AOE heal from range, which is quite good. It's three TP cost though, so it's kind of expensive. Helping hand heals adjacent allies at the start of a turn. So let's say you positioned Cordelia somewhere and then you put allies around her. They will at the start of her turn, then heal. She gets elude, which is kind of odd. It just, it's a single target evasion buff or evasion buff for a single ally, which is Weird, again, evasion is not very reliable from what I've seen, so I would probably never use this. And then she gets for her final skill, I think on her final promotion, is self-sacrifice. It costs nothing to use, but it decreases her own HP by 50% to recover an ally's HP by 50%. This is a little bit of a weird one because her heals are so strong that she would probably be healing 50% of the other unit's HP anyways with a normal heal, but I guess if you're strapped for TP and you don't know what to do, you can use this. Her weapon skill above and beyond is actually really, really good. So it's four TP, but it's very expensive. And it's, an, it's a super strong heal. I think it's probably the strongest heal in the game. And it has the potential to overheal. So if anyone's played RuneScape, you know, when you, you use the Anglerfish and you get extra HP above your own HP or Ceradom and Bruise or whatever it is that does that, this can say you have 500 base HP. If you heal 400, your character will have 900 HP at this point. That's just how it works you get more HP than your maximum. And I can see this being quite useful, but it is also quite a steep price. So you will want some kind of TP buffer if you're going to try and use this. This would probably be really good on someone like Eridor or your tanks. Although I have to wonder how that messes with the threshold of 50% HP skills that work with her. I would assume that something like a uh, the Desperate Defense skill is only in condition when you're under the unit's 50% base health, not under the 50% health they had before. So maybe not the best, but it is a really, really strong heal. Unfortunately, it is single target. 
In terms of her weapon skills, this unit is very, very easy to build. You prioritize her weapon potency because that increases her heals, and then you don't really need anything else until her tier 3. You have the increased healing range by 1, which is very helpful, and you also have the tier 3 weapon skill, which is above and beyond. So super easy unit to build. Her split skill, the one with the regen and um, the other one, I would probably prioritize the regen to increase its duration, but I really wish it was increasing the regen's strength instead of duration. Now, I personally have not used Cordelia. I'm just judging her off what I see. I'm not very big on healers in this game, and this one doesn't even have a revive like Gila does. So I actually think Gila, one, has better join time than Cordelia. Two, has revive, which is better than self-sacrifice or above and beyond, at least in my opinion. And three... Cordelia is in this weird gauntlet of chapter 15 units that you want to recruit. Milo is the best. And then Travis and Trish are kind of eh. And Cordelia is a really, really strong healer, but she joins so late that saying that she's a good unit is kind of hard based on her availability. I would definitely put her somewhere in the mid-tiers. She's not bad. She's an amazing healer. But she's just pretty frail, late join time, and getting her first means you're sacrificing the opportunity to get someone like a Milo, for example. So, yeah. That's Cordelia, solid unit, but I don't think she's anything super useful. All right, so the last of the chapter 15 recruits to get is Trish. And like I mentioned in the Travis section, the way to get Trish is that you have to protect the Roselle in chapter 12 and then go down the chapter 15 route that lets you visit, visit their village. Trish is probably one of the most underwhelming units in the game. She doesn't really do anything super special. She is just the definition of a thief. And thieves in this game, like I mentioned with Travis, stealing items is not very good because you rarely get any very good items. I actually don't know what the steal drop table is or the percentages. Maybe someone will compile that in the future. But anyways, let's look at Trish's skills. She gets the Blessing of Fire, which is increased fire resistance and decreased ice resistance, which is like whatever. She gets Blazing Arrow, or Flaming Arrow, which is basically fire damage on an arrow. Nothing super special, we saw that on her. She gets Leap, which lets her jump. And later on with one of her weapon skills, you can reduce that to be free, which is nice for mobility, I guess, but again, nothing super amazing. She gets Item Gatherer, and what that does is it lets you pick up spoils while you're walking. And this is very nice because it does synergize with one of her weapon skills, which I'll talk about a little bit later. She also gets Plundering Shot, which gives you a chance to steal an item when using a normal attack. Again, the stealables in this game are nothing to be super excited about, so it's nice, but it's nothing amazing. Bullseye is a attack with low power but has guaranteed hit, which I found odd because... Hit rates and percentages in this game, even on hard mode, even on New Game Plus, I didn't really find them to be an issue. So I don't know why we need sort of a guaranteed hit kind of thing. And then the last skill that she gets upon promotion is another passive, which increases the likelihood of stealing items from enemies, of enemies afflicted with stat status ailments. Again, stealing items from enemies is not really that lucrative, and I don't know why there's so much emphasis on it in this character, but this is probably one of the worst units in the entire game, because she doesn't really do anything outside of stealing. And even if you're grinding out materials, and you think that she'd be convenient to sort of walk over a bunch of them and grab a bunch of them, you would rather Lionel do that and take a little bit more time so that you can get, get some extra gold, you know? So why would I ever really use Trish? It just kind of doesn't make sense. Anyways, looking at her weapon tree, she has a passive in tier one, which is clear skies accuracy up, which is self-explanatory, more accuracy with clear weather. Again, I don't know why accuracy is a problem in the game. They're making her sign kind of this true hit unit, but whatever. In tier two, her interesting skill is treasure and TP, which grants one TP when picking up spoils. So this is interesting because potentially you could get more than one TP when you're running over stuff. So if you're picking up like two or three bags at the same time, maybe you get two TP. But what is she really going to use that TP on? Flaming arrow? She doesn't really have the skill set to really make use of this. If she had some very expensive you know, 4 TP cost or 3 TP cost thing, this would be great. Also, on normal story maps, getting items on the ground to drop is pretty rare in general, so you're not really going to be able to utilize this very frequently. 
And on her final weapon tier, her special skill, her special weapon skill is Act Again, which lets you act twice on your turn for two turns. This is basically like Anna's Act Twice. You get to go twice. That's basically what it is. It's pretty good, but Trish is such an underwhelming unit that like, what are you going to do? You're just going to normal attack twice. You're going to flaming arrow twice. It's really not that special, but if you are absolutely hell-bent on building her, I would just do the normal weapon potency up. Maybe give her the clear skies thing so you make sure she hits. The speed upgrades are nice, and then you can get act twice, yeah, and the TP thing. I mean, the luck on the right-hand side is really weird. I, I really need to figure out what luck does in this game. If anyone knows what luck does, just let me know in the comments. But yeah, that's pretty much Trish. And as I'm recording this, I just got confirmation that every single item you pick up gets you one more TP. So thanks, Rolltear, for the information. He's also the one who provided the screenshots. You the real MVP. And yeah, that's it for Trish. And I got nothing more to say about her. So we are going to move on. All right, it is time for the Omega Spoiler 2 characters. This is your last chance. Otherwise, you're going to get spoiled on some pretty big plot twists and some pretty big story stuff. So, this is the last time I'm going to say it before jumping into the next character. Three, two, one, I'm going. The first character I'm going to talk about of the two is Maxwell. Now, you've all seen Maxwell's skill set because he does show up on the field in Chapter 6 before he unfortunately quote-unquote dies in his battle against Avlora. Maxwell is a great unit. Absolutely fantastic. He has triple thrust, which is pretty big physical damage to a single enemy. And with his weapon skills, you can reduce this down to a TP cost of one. So he can spam this pretty much every turn. He's got run through, which is basically the same skill that Roland has. And that makes sense because he's Roland's teacher. So he moves four squares in a straight line and deals physical damage along the way. It's funny because triple thrust is basically Roland's double thrust, but it's stronger power. Again, he's Roland's teacher. He has Lance Hurl, which is a ranged attack that also does a decent amount of damage. It is a little bit less than Triple Thrust, but it is 1 to 4 range. So this is pretty nice if you need a ranged option to sort of ranged option to snipe something. Counter Stance is what Eridor has, so he counterattacks when attacked by an adjacent enemy. It's only a chance, so it's not very consistent. Two Birds, One Stone is very nice considering his run-through skill is he just gets an extra TP when attacking two or more enemies at the same time. And he has Traverse, which is basically turns him into a Dragoon. He can move to a selected square regardless of height and jump up there once, and he uses the command. He also gets one more command, but can only move once. So you can traverse and then throw your lance, for example, or triple thrust, or run through, or normal attack. So traverse is very, very nice. Now this is what makes Maxwell really, really good. He has an auto revive, which gives him the ability to recover one time after falling in battle. So if Maxwell di dies, he just revives and gets back to full HP. So basically he's got double the HP, double the defense, double the strength, double the durability. It makes him really, really good, and you can be very aggressive with him on his first life while being slightly less aggressive on the second life once he comes back. Looking at Maxwell's weapon tree, this is fairly self-explanatory as, as to what you want to do. You want to get his weapon damage up as much as you can. His high jump is really good. Actually, let me unlock this for the sake of the video so that I can show you the details on it. So yeah, Maxwell's high jump is a 5 TP skill that has the same amount of power as triple thrust, but it allows you to jump at range to a specific square and then deal physical damage to all enemies within range. So you can use this and then get the two birds one stone boost with Maxwell. So it's, it's actually pretty good, especially if you need to take out multiple enemies or nuke them or something like that. It does high damage. So I do like this as a weapon skill. It's pretty expensive to unlock, but it's pretty good. What I would do with Maxwell though is I would still probably go with the weapon potency up before high jump just because this is going to apply towards all of his damage whereas high jump will only apply to the instances where you have that 5 TP and you can use the big nuke. The speed upgrade is pretty nice on him. It lets him have one of the highest base speeds in the game so he gets to move more often. And I upgraded the TP cost of triple strike or triple thrust decrease by one because I thought it was more reliable than weakness exploit. This is basically just good against cavalry for Maxwell, because otherwise I don't think anyone else has a weapon uh, a weapon weakness to spears. So there you go. Decreasing the TP cost of triple thrust by one seems to be the way to go. Everything else is pretty much optional. He doesn't really need three extra magic defense. The HP upgrade is okay. 10 HP is nice, but it's nothing major. It gets him above 500, and he doesn't really need the accuracy. So weapon potency, speed, decreasing triple thrust, and high jump. 
pretty much the upgrades that I have here right now are, are fairly good and this is what you want on Maxwell. He's a very good unit. I wouldn't put him in S tier, but he is probably a solid A tier just because of his survivability and his revive. That alone makes him basically a 1000 HP character who gets a second lease on life, who you can really do a lot of stuff with. You can put him in the front lines to tank. You can, you know, send him off pretty far ahead to nuke things. It just, it gives him so much more flexibility. So yeah, I like Maxwell. I think he's very good. The condition for you to unlock him, however, I think, I think from what I'm hearing, is that you need to have certain levels of convictions. I think it's a little bit higher morality than anything else. And he only joins you after you're done with chapter 14. So he can join you on your normal first playthrough if you have that level of convictions. I had very low morality because I'm an, just an immoral person, as you guys can tell. So I didn't get him until New Game Plus, and I didn't get to play around with him until New Game Plus. But when I did get him, he was very fun to use. So by virtue of the fact that he joins after the mid game, I also can't give him that very super high S tier. He also doesn't change battle entirely by himself, but he is a very solid character. So yeah, probably around A tier. Still a very fun character to use. Would recommend you use him. Now it's time for me to move on to the very last character in this list and probably everyone's very last character that they will recruit. You probably have an idea of who this is, but let's get to it. The last character you're going to unlock is Avlora. Now a lot of people probably saw this coming, especially when you see her relationship with Cordelia. But Avlora is a character that is locked to one very specific route, and like her, the color of her armor in her final promotion, this is the golden route of the game. You can't get Avlora on any other route. She joins on the first chapter of the golden route, she comes and pledges her loyalty to you, and she doesn't join any other way. So I had to do the golden route in order to get her. Having said that, Avlora is an absolute beast. If you didn't find her intimidating during her boss battles, then I don't know what's wrong with you, but she also is very, very strong as a unit here in terms of how hard she hits and the amount of damage that she can tank. She's got pretty good physical defense and her magic defense for a knight character is actually relatively okay. So she'll be able to take, you know, one and a half magic attacks on hard mode because magic hits really hard on hard, maybe two. Anyways, let's go through her abilities. She has Desperate Strike, which deals greater physical damage when at 50% or less of your maximum HP. So think Dark Knight. Dark Knights usually have this thing where the lower their HP, the more damage they do. And this pairs really well with a non-cost skill that she has, or non-TP cost skill she has, called Risky Maneuver. Risky Maneuver, when she uses it as a boss, only decreases her HP by 5%. But as a unit, I guess to balance her out, it decreases her HP by 15% of max to deal really strong physical damage to a single enemy. This hits really, really hard. So yeah, Avlora is a DPS character. She also has no escape, which is quite less hard hitting, but it uses TP and it hits enemies across three horizontal lines to lower their evasion and movement for three turns. This is useful because it can decrease the movement of enemies and make them unable to get to your back line or approach any other units or even let Avlora kind of hit and run away from them if she needs to. Desperate Defense is a very synergistic skill. We've seen this before on someone like Eridor, for example, or Hasabara, where she takes less damage when her HP is at 50% or below. This made her a really annoying boss, but it also synergizes very well with Desperate Strike and Risky Maneuver. So it makes Avlora quite a bit tankier, and it lets her do more damage because she's hovering around that margin. So, so yeah, Avlora has a very, very nice kit. Spare, more effort, or spare no effort is something I didn't really use. It raises your strength and evasion, but lowers your physical defense. Now this is high risk, high reward, because she might evade something, but if you're lowering phys physical defense, you might be getting killed here. Now. This pairs nicely with Desperate Defense, because Desperate Defense, I think, is a 50% damage mitigation. So lowering your defense when you're already taking only half damage below 50% might not necessarily be that bad of an idea if you're going to end up hitting really, really, really hard later on with Avlora. I played around with this character a little bit and I love using her, but she's someone that I would need to experiment with a little bit more to sort of optimize her damage and see how hard she can actually hit with this. Prevail and Power Up is a passive that increases strength for three turns when you kill something, so it's kind of like the equivalent of Groma's that increased her evasion, but this one is strength for Avlora. Again, she's all about power and all about hitting hard. Lone Wolf is a passive that increases your stats. With the fewer units you have on the field, the greater the boost. I haven't tested this, but I want to see 
how much this increases things if she solos and whether or not Evlora is actually able to solo things like New Game Plus maps. That will be really interesting to see if there's any crazy people go for it and tell me how it goes or maybe I'll try it out myself and see. But this feels very fun to use. And Bloody Cross is her weapon skill. The moment I saw it, I knew I had to unlock it. We saw it in the post chapter six story clip. And depending on what chapters you play later on, you might have seen Evlora use this in battle. This is a really fun skill. It deals physical damage to all enemies in cardinal directions within three squares and knocks them back. Uh, it's really badass. The animation looks really cool. It's a very fun skill to use. And Evlora actually doesn't have many TP using skills. So this is a weapon skill that might actually be viable for her to use. Because Risky Maneuver is free, that's probably your main damage skill. And I don't see you really using no escape or spare no effort in a spammy kind of way. So Bloody Cross is a weapon skill worth unlocking because you probably will be able to use it at least once or twice per map. Let's talk about Evlora's weapon tree. And you know, this is a no brainer. You want to upgrade her weapon potency. She's all about damage. You want to give her all the damage she can get. Unfortunately, she doesn't have any strength upgrades, which is kind of annoying. And the max HP upgrades are only beneficial for her. So you can get those because of her decreases being percentage based. The more HP she has, the more HP she has below 50%, which is the more damage she can take below 50%. So these are good to unlock. Increasing damage dealt by Risky Maneuver is a no brainer. This is going to be your bread and butter damage. So you should definitely get this. And Bloody Cross is nice, as well as Desperate Strike too, which increases physical damage dealt when your HP is at 25% or below. This is something I wanna try and get and see if I can stack it with Desperate Strike 1 and really push the limits of Evlora's damage and see what she can do. So she is very much a very high risk, very high reward unit. I want to initially say that you can give her just more strength amulets and really see how much you can push her damage. But part of me also wants to give her the resurrection earring just in case she dies, I get her to have a second lease on life and try her to go again. She is pretty tanky. So a resurrection earring really isn't bad. Maybe you combo that with one of the strength increasing accessories. So yeah, Avlora again, she's a very self-sustainable unit, but kind of like Maxwell, I probably wouldn't put her in broken tier or S tier. She would probably be a very high A tier unit, especially because of her availability. Maybe that even puts her at B tier, especially if she's only going to be gotten on a new game plus or a new game plus plus run. She's not someone you're likely to get on your first run, especially if you're going in blind. So yeah, that's my verdict on Evlora. Very strong character. And with that, we have actually rounded out this character guide. Just clicking back into Saranoa here for anyone who is rejoining us after the spoiler free or the spoiler section is over. That's pretty much it for my character guide. I know this is very, very long and I hope it's been thorough enough to cover all the characters and give you my thoughts on them and whatever I think they place on a tier list and how useful they are. Again, I haven't used all of these characters personally, so my judgment may be skewed on the few that I told you about, but I did try and experiment with almost the entire roster and really push them to their limits through New Game Plus Hard, because I feel like that's the mode that you, characters will really shine as to how useful they are. So my judgment is a little bit skewed towards that. Having said that, I'm getting really, really tired of talking after recording all this and I'm dreading editing this down. So I'm gonna go take a little bit of a break and go do that, and I will see you all in another video very, very soon. Peace.